This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park. Introduction Mungo Park was born on the 10th of September, 1771, the son of a farmer at Fowlshields near Selkirk. After studying medicine in Edinburgh, he went out at the age of 21, assistant surgeon in a ship bound for the East Indies. When he came back, the African Society was in want of an explorer to take the place of Major Houghton, who had died. Mungo Park volunteered, was accepted, and in his twenty-fourth year, on the 22nd of May, 1795, he sailed for the coast of Senegal, where he arrived in June. Thence he proceeded on the travels of which this book is the record. He was absent from England for a little more than two years and a half, returning a few days before Christmas, 1797. He was then twenty-six years old. The African Association published the first edition of his travels as Travels in the Interior Districts of Africa, 1795 to 1797, by Mungo Park, with an appendix containing geographical illustrations of Africa by Major Rennell. Park married and settled at Peebles in medical practice but was persuaded by the government to go out again. He sailed from Portsmouth on the 30th of January, 1805, resolved to trace the Niger to its source or perish in the attempt. He perished. The natives attacked him while passing through a narrow strait of the river at Bosa and killed him with all that remained of his party except one slave. The record of this fatal voyage, partly gathered from his journals and closed by evidences of the matter of his death, was first published in 1815 as The Journal of a Mission to the Interior of Africa in 1805 by Mungo Park, together with other documents, official and private, relating to the same mission to which is prefixed an account of the life of mr park volume one chapter one journey from portsmouth to the gambia soon after my return from the east indies in seventeen ninety three having learned that the noblemen and gentlemen associated for the purpose of prosecuting discoveries in the interior of africa were desirous of engaging a person to explore the continent by the way of the gambia river i took occasion through means of the president of the royal society to whom i had the honor to be known of offering myself for that service i had been informed that a gentleman of the name of houghton a captain in the army and formerly fort major at goree had already sailed to the gambia under the direction of the association and that there was reason to apprehend he had fallen a sacrifice to the climate or perished in some contest with the natives but this intelligence instead of deterring me from my purpose animated me to persist in the offer of my services with the greater solicitude i had a passionate desire to examine into the productions of a country so little known and to become experimentally acquainted with the modes of life and character of the natives i knew that i was able to bear fatigue and i relied on my youth and the strength of my constitution to preserve me from the effects of the climate the salary which the committee allowed was sufficiently large and i made no stipulation for future reward if i should perish in my journey i was willing that my hopes and expectations 
should perish with me and if i should succeed in rendering the geography of africa more familiar to my countrymen and in opening to their ambition and industry new sources of wealth and new channels of commerce i knew that i was in the hands of men of honor who would not fail to bestow that remuneration which my successful services should appear to them to merit the committee of the association having made such inquiries as they thought necessary declared themselves satisfied with the qualifications that i possessed and accepted me for the service and with that liberality which on all occasions distinguishes their conduct gave me every encouragement which it was in their power to grant or which i could with propriety ask it was at first proposed that i should accompany mr james willis who was then recently appointed consul at senegambia and whose countenance in that capacity it was thought might have served and protected me but government afterwards rescinded his appointment and i lost that advantage the kindness of the committee however supplied all that was necessary being favored by the secretary of the association the late henry beaufoy esq with a recommendation to dr john laidley a gentleman who had resided many years at an english factory on the banks of the gambia and furnished with a letter of credit on him for two hundred pounds i took my passage in the brig endeavour a small vessel trading to the gambia for beeswax and ivory commanded by captain richard wyatt and i became impatient for my departure my instructions were very plain and concise i was directed on my arrival in africa to pass on to the river niger either by way of bambuk or by such other route as should be found most convenient that i should ascertain the course and if possible the rise and termination of that river that i should use my utmost exertions to visit the principal towns or cities in its neighborhood particularly timbuktu and hausa and that i should be afterwards at liberty to return to europe either by way of the gambia or by such other route as under all the then existing circumstances of my situation and prospects should appear to me to be most advisable we sailed from portsmouth on the twenty-second day of may seventeen ninety five on the fourth of june we saw the mountains over mogador on the coast of africa and on the twenty-first of the same month after a pleasant voyage of thirty days we anchored at jilfury a town on the northern bank of the river gambia opposite to james island where the english had formerly a small fort the kingdom of bera in which the town of jilfury is situated produces great plenty of the necessaries of life but the chief trade of the inhabitants is in salt which commodity they carry up the river in canoes as high as Baraconda, and bring down in return indian corn cotton claws elephants teeth small quantities of gold dust etc the number of canoes and people constantly employed in this trade makes the king of bera more formidable to europeans than any other chieftain on the river and this circumstance probably encouraged him to establish these exorbitant duties which traders of all nations are obliged to pay at entry amounting to nearly twenty pounds on every vessel great and small these duties or customs are generally collected in person by the alcade or governor of jilfrey 
and he is attended on these occasions by a numerous train of dependents among whom are found many who by their frequent intercourse with the english have acquired a smattering of our language but they are commonly very noisy and very troublesome begging for everything they fancy with such earnestness and importunity the traders in order to get quit of them are frequently obliged to grant their requests on the twenty third we departed from Geoffrey and proceeded to vinatane a town situated about two miles up a creek on the southern side of the river this place is much resorted to by europeans on account of the great quantities of beeswax which are brought hither for sale the wax is collected in the woods by the faloops a wild and unsociable race of people their country which is of considerable extent abounds in rice and the natives supply the traders both on the gambia and casamansa rivers with that article and also with goats and poultry on very reasonable terms the honey which they collect is chiefly used by themselves in making a strong intoxicating liquor much the same as the mead which is produced from honey in great britain in their traffic with europeans the faloops generally employ a factor or agent of the mandigo nation who speaks a little english and is acquainted with the trade of the river this broker makes the bargain and with the conveyance of the european receives a certain part only of the payment which he gives to his employer as the whole the remainder which is very truly called the cheating money he receives when the faloup is gone and appropriates to himself as a reward for his trouble the language of the faloups is appropriate and peculiar and as their trade is chiefly conducted as hath been observed by mandigos the europeans have no inducement to learn it on the twenty sixth we left vindain and continued our course up the river anchoring whenever the tide failed us and frequently towing the vessel with the boat the river is deep and muddy the banks are covered with impenetrable thickets of mangrove and the whole of the adjacent country appears to be flat and swampy the gambia abounds with fish some species of which are excellent food but none of them that i recollect are known in europe at the entrance from the sea sharks are found in great abundance and higher up alligators and the hippopotamus or river horse are very numerous in six days after leaving vintin we reached john aconda a place of considerable trade where our vessel was to take in part of her lading the next morning the several european traders came from their different factories to receive their letters and learn the nature and amount of her cargo and the captain dispatched a messenger to dr laidley to inform him of my arrival he came to jock aconda the morning following when i delivered him mr beaufoy's letter and he gave me a kind invitation to spend my time at his house until an opportunity should offer of prosecuting my journey this invitation was too acceptable to be refused and being furnished with the doctor with a horse and guide i set out from jock conda at daybreak on the fifth of july and at eleven o'clock arrived in pisania where i was accommodated with a room and other conveniences in the doctor's house pisania is a small village in the king of yanni's dominions established by british subjects as a factory for trade and inhabited solely by them and their black servants it is situated on the banks of the gambia sixteen miles above Johnaconda. 
the white residents at the time of may arrival there consisted only of dr laidley and two gentlemen who were brothers of the name of ainsley but their domestics were numerous they enjoyed perfect security under the king's protection and being highly esteemed and respected by the natives at large wanted no accommodation or comfort which the country could supply and the greatest part of the trade in slaves ivory and gold was in their hands being now settled for some time at my ease my first object was to learn the mandigo tongue being the language in almost general use throughout this part of africa and without which i was fully convinced that i never could acquire an extensive knowledge of the country or its inhabitants in this pursuit i was greatly assisted by dr laidley in researches of this kind and in observing the manners and customs of the natives in a country so little known to the nations of europe and furnished with so many striking and uncommon objects of nature my time passed not unpleasantly and i began to flatter myself that i had escaped the fever or seasoning to which europeans on their first arrival in hot climates are generally subject but on the thirty first of july i imprudently exposed myself to the night dew in observing an eclipse of the moon with a view to determine the longitude of the place the next day i found myself attacked with a smart fever and delirium and such an illness followed as confined me to the house during the greatest part of august my recovery was very slow but i embraced every short interval of convalescence to walk out and make myself acquainted with the productions of the country in one of those excursions having rambled farther than usual on a hot day i brought on a return of my fever and on the tenth of september i was again confined to my bed the fever however was not so violent as before and in the course of three weeks i was able when the weather would permit to renew my botanical excursions and when it rained i amused myself with drawing plants etc in my chamber the care and attention of dr laidley contributed greatly to alleviate my sufferings his company and conversation beguiled the tedious hours during that gloomy season when the rain falls in torrents when suffocating heat oppresses by day and when the night is spent by the terrified travellers in listening to the croaking of frogs of which the numbers are beyond imagination the shrill cry of the jackal and the deep howling of the hyena a dismal concert interrupted only by the roar of such tremendous thunder as no person can form a conception of but those who have heard it the country itself being an immense level and very generally covered with wood presents a tiresome and gloomy uniformity to the eye but although nature has denied to the inhabitants the beauties of romantic landscapes she has bestowed on them with a liberal hand the more important blessings of fertility and abundance a little attention to cultivation procures a sufficiency of corn the fields afford a rich pasturage for cattle and the natives are plentifully supplied with excellent fish both from the gambia river and the wali creek the grains which are chiefly cultivated are indian corn zia maize two kinds of holcus spicatus called by the natives sono and sanio holcus niger and holcus bicolor the former of which they have named bassi wolima and the latter bassi qui these together with rice are raised in considerable quantities 
besides which the inhabitants in the vicinity of the towns and villages have gardens which produce onions calavances yams cassavi ground nuts pompions gourds watermelons and some other esculent plants i observe likewise near the towns small patches of cotton and indigo the former of these articles supplies them with clothing and with the latter they dye their cloth of an excellent blue color in a manner that will hereafter be described in preparing their corn for food the natives use a large wooden mortar called a palloon in which they bruise the seed until it parts with the outer covering or husk which is then separated from the clean corn by exposing it to the wind nearly in the same manner as wheat is cleared from the chaff in england the corn thus freed from the husk is returned to the mortar and beaten into meal which is dressed variously in different countries but the most common preparation of it among the nations of the gambia is a sort of pudding which they call couscous it is made from first moistening the flour with water and then stirring and shaking it about in a large calabash or gourd till it adheres together in small granules resembling sago it is then put into an earthen pot whose bottom is perforated with a number of small holes and this pot being placed upon another the two vessels are looted together either with a paste of meal and water or with cow's dung and placed upon the fire in the lower vessel is commonly some animal food and water the steam or vapor of which ascends through the perforations in the bottom of the upper vessel and softens and the couscous which is very much esteemed throughout all the countries that i visited i am informed that the same manner of preparing flour is very generally used on the barbary coast and that the dish is so prepared is there called by the same name it is therefore probable that the negroes borrowed the practice from the moors their domestic animals are nearly the same as in europe swine are found in the woods but their flesh is not esteemed probably the marked abhorrence in which this animal is held by the votaries of mohammed has spread itself among the pagans poultry of all kinds the turkey excepted is everywhere to be had the guinea fowl and red partridge abound in the fields and the woods furnish a small species of antelope of which the venison is highly and deservedly prized of the other wild animals in the mandigo countries the most common are the hyena the panther and the elephant considering the use that is made of the latter in the east indies it may be thought extraordinary that the natives of africa have not in any part of this immense continent acquired the skill of taming this powerful and docile creature and applying his strength and faculties to the service of man when i told some of the natives that this was actually done in the countries of the east my auditors laughed me to scorn and exclaimed tobacco fornio a white man's lie the negroes frequently find means to destroy the elephant by firearms they hunt it principally for the sake of the teeth which they transfer in barter to those who sell them again to the europeans the flesh they eat and consider it a great delicacy on the sixth of october the waters of the gambia were at the greatest height being fifteen feet above the high water mark of the tide after which they began to subside at first slowly but afterwards very rapidly sometimes sinking more than a foot in twenty-four hours by the beginning of november the river had sunk to its former level 
and the tide ebbed and flowed as usual when the river had subsided and the atmosphere grew dry i recovered space and began to think of my departure for this is reckoned the most proper season for travelling the natives had completed their harvest and provisions were everywhere cheap and plentiful dr laidley was at this time employed in a trading voyage at jacaconda i wrote him to desire that he would use his interest with the slatees or slave merchants to procure me the company and protection of the first coffle or caravan that might leave gambia for the interior country and in the meantime i requested him to purchase for me a horse and two asses a few days afterwards the doctor returned to pisana and informed me that a coffle would certainly go for the interior in the course of the dry season but that as many of the merchants belonging to it had not yet completed their assortment of goods he could not say at what time they would set out as the characters and dispositions of the slatees and people that composed the caravan were entirely unknown to me and they seemed rather averse to my purpose and unwilling to enter into any positive engagements on my account and the time of their departure being with all very uncertain i resolved on further deliberation to avail myself of the dry season and proceed without them dr laidley approved my determination and promised me every assistance in his power to enable me to prosecute my journey with comfort and safety this resolution having been formed i made preparations accordingly and now being about to take leave of my hospitable friend whose kindness and solicitude continued to the moment of my departure and to quit for many months the countries bordering on the gambia it seems proper before i proceed with my narrative that i should in this place give some account of the several negro nations which inhabit the banks of this celebrated river and the commercial intercourse that subsists between them and such of the nations of europe as find their advantage in trading to this part of africa the observations which have occurred to me on both these subjects will be found in the following chapter volume one chapter two language and religion of the natives the natives of the countries bordering on the gambia though distributed into a great many distinct governments may i think be divided into four great classes the faloops the jalofs the fulas and the mandigos among all these nations the religion of mohammed has made and continues to make considerable progress but in most of them the body of the people both free and enslaved persevere in maintaining the blind but harmless superstitions of their ancestors and are called by the mohammedans kafirs or infidels of the faloops i have little to add to what has been observed concerning them in the former chapter they are of a gloomy disposition and are supposed never to forgive an injury they are even said to transmit their quarrels as deadly feuds to their posterity insomuch that a son considers it as incumbent on him from a just sense of filial obligation to become the avenger of his deceased father's wrongs if a man loses his life in one of these sudden quarrels which perpetually occur at their feasts when the whole party is intoxicated with mead his son or the eldest of his sons if he has more than one endeavors to procure his father's sandals which he wears once a year 
on the anniversary of his father's death until a fit opportunity offers of revenging his fate when the object of his resentment seldom escapes his pursuit this fierce and unrelenting disposition is however counterbalanced by many good qualities they display the utmost gratitude and affection towards their benefactors and the fidelity with which they preserve whatever is entrusted to them is remarkable during the present war they have more than once taken up arms to defend our merchant vessels from french privateers and english property of considerable value has frequently been left at vintain for a long time entirely under the care of the Faloups, who have uniformly manifested on such occasions the strictest honesty and punctuality how greatly is it to be wished that the minds of a people so determined and faithful could be softened and civilized by the mild and benevolent spirit of christianity the jaloffs or yaloffs are an active powerful and warlike race inhabiting great part of that tract which lies between the river senegal and the bandingo states on the gambia yet they differ from the mandingos not only in language but likewise in complexion and features the noses of the jaloffs are not so much depressed nor the lips so protuberant as among the generality of africans and although their skin is of the deepest black they are considered by the white traders as the most sightly negroes on this part of the continent their language is said to be copious and significant and is often learnt by europeans trading to senegal the fulas or folies such as them at least as reside near the gambia are chiefly of a tawny complexion with soft silky hair and pleasing features they are much attached to a pastoral life and have introduced themselves into all the kingdoms on the windward coast as herdsmen and husbandmen paying a tribute to the sovereign of the country for the lands which they hold not having many opportunities however during my residence at pisana of improving my acquaintance with these people i defer entering at large into their character until a fitter occasion occurs which will present itself when i come to bondu the mandingos of whom it remains to speak constitute in truth the bulk of the inhabitants in all those districts of africa which i visited and their language with a few exceptions is universally understood and very generally spoken in that part of the continent they are called mandingos i conceive as having originally migrated from the interior state of manding of which some account will hereafter be given in every considerable town there is a chief magistrate called the al kid whose office is hereditary and whose business it is to preserve order to levy duties on travellers and to preside at all conferences in the exercise of local jurisdiction and the administration of justice these courts are composed of the elders of the town of free condition and are termed palavers and their proceedings are conducted in the open air with sufficient solemnity both sides of a question are freely canvassed witnesses are publicly examined and the decisions which follow generally meet with the approbation of the surrounding audience as negroes have no written language of their own the general rule of decision is an appeal to ancient custom but since the system of mohammed has made so great progress among them the converts to that faith have gradually introduced with the religious tenets 
many of the civil institutions of the prophet and where the koran is not found sufficiently explicit recourse is had to a commentary called al shara containing as i was told a complete exposition or digest of the mohammedan laws both civil and criminal properly arranged and illustrated this frequency of appeal to written laws with which the pagan natives are necessarily unacquainted has given rise in their palvers to what i little expected to find in africa professional advocates or expounders of the law who are allowed to appear and to plead for plaintiff or defendant much in the same manner as counsel in the law courts of great britain they are mohammedan negroes who have made or affect to have made the laws of the prophet their particular study and if i may judge from their harangues which i frequently attended i believe that in the forensic qualifications of procrastination and cavil and the arts of confounding and perplexing a cause they are not always surpassed by the ablest pleaders in europe while i was at pisana a cause was heard which furnished the mohammedan lawyers with an admirable opportunity of displaying their professional dexterity the cause was this an ass belonging to a sarah woolly negro a native of an interior country near the river senegal had broke into a field of corn belonging to one of the mandingo inhabitants and destroyed great part of it the mandingo having caught the animal in his field immediately drew his knife and cut his throat the Sirawuli thereupon called a palver, or in European terms, brought an action to recover damages for the loss of his beast, on which he set a high value. The defendant confessed that he had killed the ass, but pleaded a set-off, insisting that the loss he had sustained by the ravage of in his corn was equal to the sum demanded for the animal to ascertain this fact was the point at issue and the learned advocates contrived to puzzle the cause in such a manner that after a hearing of three days the court broke up without coming to any determination upon it and a second palverer was i suppose thought necessary the mandingos generally speaking are of a mild sociable and obliging disposition the men are commonly above the middle size well shaped strong and capable of enduring great labor the women are good-natured sprightly and agreeable the dress of both sexes is composed of cotton cloth of their own manufacture that of the men is a loose frock not unlike a surplice with drawers which reach half way down the leg and they wear sandals on their feet and white cotton caps on their heads the women's dress consists of two pieces of cloth each of which is about six feet long and three broad one of these they wrap around their waist which hanging down to the ankles answers the purpose of a petticoat the other is thrown negligently over the bosom and shoulders this account of their clothing is indeed nearly applicable to the natives of all the different countries in this part of africa a peculiar national mode is observable only in the headdresses of the women thus in the countries of the gambia the females wear a sort of bandage which they call jala it is a narrow strip of cotton cloth wrapped many times round immediately over the forehead in bondu the head is encircled with strings of white beads and a small plate of gold is worn in the middle of the forehead in kasson 
the ladies decorate their heads in a very tasteful and elegant manner with white seashells in carta and ludamar the women raise their hair to a great height by the addition of a pad as the ladies did formerly in great britain which they decorate with a species of coral brought from the red sea by pilgrims returning from mecca and sold at a great price in the construction of their dwelling houses the mandingos also conform to the general practice of the african nations in this part of the continent contenting themselves with small and incommodious hovels a circular mud wall about four feet high upon which is placed a conical roof composed of the bamboo cane and thatched with grass forms alike the palace of a king and the hovel of a slave their household furniture is equally simple a hurdle of canes placed upon upright sticks about two feet from the ground upon which is spread a mat or bullock's hide answers the purpose of a bed a water jar some earthen pots for dressing their food a few wooden bowls and calabashes and one or two low stools compose the rest as every man of free condition has a plurality of wives it is found necessary to prevent i suppose matrimonial disputes that each of the ladies should be accommodated with a hut to herself and all the huts belonging to the same family are surrounded by a fence constructed of bamboo canes split and formed into a sort of wicker work the whole enclosure is called a cirque or cirque a number of these enclosures with narrow passages between them form what is called a town but the huts are generally placed without any regularity according to the caprice of the owner the only rule that seems to be attended to is placing the door towards the southwest in order to admit the sea breeze in each town is a large stage called the bentang which answers the purpose of a public hall or town house it is composed of interwoven canes and is generally sheltered from the sun by being erected in the shade of some large tree it is here that all public affairs are transacted and trials conducted and here the lazy and indolent meet to smoke their pipes and hear the news of the day in most of the towns the mohammedans have also a mezura or mosque in which they assemble and offer up their daily prayers according to the rules of the koran in the account which i have thus given of the natives the reader must bear in mind that my observations appear chiefly to persons of free condition which constitute i suppose not more than one-fourth part of the inhabitants at large the other three-fourths are in a state of hopeless and hereditary slavery and are employed in cultivating the land in the care of cattle and in servile offices of all kinds much in the same manner as the slaves in the west indies i was told however that the mandingo master can neither deprive his slave of life nor sell him to a stranger without first calling a palaver on his conduct or in other words bringing him to a public trial but this degree of protection is extended only to the native or domestic slave captives taken in war and those unfortunate victims who are condemned to slavery for crimes or insolvency and in short all those unhappy people who are brought down from the interior countries for sale have no security whatever and may be treated and disposed of in all respects as the owner thinks proper it sometimes happens indeed when no ships are on the coast that a humane and considerate master incorporates his purchased slaves 
among his domestics and their offspring at least if not the parents become entitled to all privileges of the native class the earliest european establishment on this celebrated river was a factory of the portuguese and to this must be ascribed the introduction of the numerous words of that language which are still in use among the negroes the dutch french and english afterwards successfully possessed themselves of settlements on the coast but the trade of the gambia became and continued for many years a sort of monopoly in the hands of the english in the travels of francis moore is preserved an account of the royal african company's establishments in this river in the year seventeen thirty at which the james factory alone consisted of a governor deputy governor and two other principal officers eight factors thirteen writers twenty inferior attendants and tradesmen a company of soldiers and thirty-two negro servants besides sloops shallops and boats with their crews and there were no less than eight subordinate factories in other parts of the river the trade with europe by being afterwards laid open was almost annihilated the share which the subjects of england at this time hold in it supports not more than two or three annual ships and i am informed that the gross value of british exports is under twenty thousand pounds the french and danes still maintain a small share and the americans have lately sent a few vessels to the gambia by way of experiment the commodities exported to the gambia from europe consist chiefly of firearms and ammunition ironware spirituous liquors tobacco cotton caps a small quantity of broadcloth and a few articles of the manufacture of manchester a small assortment of india goods with some glass beads amber and other trifles for which are taken in exchange slaves gold dust ivory beeswax and hides slaves are the chief article but the whole number which at this time are annually exported from the gambia by all nations is supposed to be under one thousand most of these unfortunate victims are brought to the coast in periodical caravans many of them from very remote inland countries for the language which they speak is not understood by the inhabitants of the maritime districts in subsequent part of my work i shall give the best information i have been able to collect concerning the manner in which they are obtained on their arrival at the coast if no immediate opportunity offers of selling them to advantage they are distributed among the neighboring villages until a slave ship arrives or until they can be sold to black traders who sometimes purchase on speculation in the meanwhile the poor wretches are kept constantly fettered two and two of them being chained together and employed in the labors of the field and i am sorry to add are very scantily fed as well as harshly treated the price of a slave varies according to the number of purchasers from europe and the arrival of caravans from the interior but in general i reckon that a young and healthy male from sixteen to twenty-five years of age may be estimated on the spot from eighteen to twenty pounds sterling the negro slave merchants as i have observed in the former chapter are called slatties who besides slaves and the merchandise which they bring for sale to the whites supply the inhabitants of the maritime districts with native iron sweet-smelling gums and frankincense and a commodity called shea tulu which literally translated signifies tree butter in payment of these articles 
the maritime states supply the interior countries with salt a scarce and valuable commodity as i frequently and painfully experienced in the course of my journey considerable quantities of this article however are also supplied to the inland natives by the moors who obtain it from the salt pits in the great desert and receive in return corn cotton cloth and slaves in their early intercourse with europeans the article that attracted most notice was iron its utility in forming the instruments of war and husbandry make it preferable to, to all others and iron soon became the measure by which the value of all other commodities was ascertained thus a certain quantity of goods of whatever denomination appearing to be equal in value to a bar of iron constituted in the trader's phraseology a bar of that particular merchandise twenty leaves of tobacco for instance were considered as a bar of tobacco and a gallon of spirits or rather spirit or rather half spirits and half water as a bar of rum a bar of one commodity being reckoned equal in value to a bar of another commodity as however it must unavoidably happen that according to the plenty or scarcity of goods at market in proportion to the demand the relative value would be subject to continual fluctuation greater precision has been found necessary and at this time the current value of a single bar of any kind is fixed by the whites at two shillings sterling thus a slave whose price is fifteen pounds is said to be worth a hundred and fifty bars in transactions of this nature it is obvious that the white trader has infinitely the advantage over the african whom therefore it is difficult to satisfy for conscious of his own ignorance he naturally becomes exceedingly suspicious and wavering and indeed so very unsettled and jealous are the negroes in their dealings with the whites that a bargain is never considered by the european as concluded until the purchase money is paid and the party has taken leave having now brought together such general observations on the country and its inhabitants as occurred to me during my residence in the vicinity of the gambia i shall detain the reader no longer with introductory matter but proceed in the next chapter to a regular detail of the incidents which happened and the reflections which arose in my mind in the course of my painful and perilous journey from its commencement until my return to the gambia volume one chapter three the kingdom of woolly journey to bondu on the second of december seventeen ninety five i took my departure from the hospitable mansion of dr laidley i was fortunately provided with a negro servant who spoke both the english and mandingo tongues his name was johnson he was a native of this part of africa and having in his youth been conveyed to jamaica as a slave he had been made free and taken to england by his master where he had resided many years and at length found his way back to his native country as he was known to dr laidley the doctor recommended him to me and i hired him as my interpreter at the rate of ten bars monthly to be paid to himself and five bars a month to be paid to his wife during his absence dr laidley furthermore provided me with a negro boy of his own named demba a sprightly youth who besides mandingo spoke the language of the sarah woolies an inland people of whom mention will be hereafter be made residing on the banks of the sangal and to induce 
him to behave well, the doctor promised him his freedom on his return, in case I should report favorably of his fidelity and services. I was furnished with a horse for myself, a small but very hardy and spirited beast, which cost me to the value of seven pounds ten shillings, and two asses for my interpreter and servant. My baggage was light, consisting chiefly of provisions for two days, a small assortment of beads, amber, and tobacco, for the purchase of a fresh supply as I proceeded, a few changes of linen and other necessary apparel, an umbrella, a pocket sextant, a magnetic compass, and a thermometer, together with two fowling pieces, two pairs of pistols, and some other small articles. A free man, a Bashreen, or Mohammedan, named Madabu, who was traveling to the kingdom of Bambara, and two Slatis, or slave merchants, of the Sarawili nation, and of the same sect, who were going to Bondu, offered their services as far as they intended respectively to proceed, as did likewise a negro named Tammy, also a Mohammedan, a native of Kasson, who had been employed some years by Dr. Laidley as a blacksmith, and was returning to his native country with the savings of his labors. All these men traveled on foot, driving their asses before them, Thus I had no less than six attendants, all of whom had been taught to regard me with great respect, and to consider that their safe return hereafter to their countries on the Gambia would depend on my preservation. Dr. Laidley himself and Mrs. Ainsley, with a number of their domestics, kindly determined to accompany me the first two days and I believe they secretly thought they should never see me afterwards. We reached Jindley the same day, having crossed the Wally Creek, a branch of the Gambia, and rested at the house of a black woman, who had formerly been the paramour of a white trader named Hewitt, and who, in consequence thereof, was called, by way of distinction, Senorita. In the evening we walked out to see an adjoining village belonging to a slatty named Jemafu Momadu, the richest of all the Gambian traders. We found him at home, and he thought so highly of the honor done him by this visit that he presented us with a fine bullock, which was immediately killed and part of it dressed for our evening's repast. The Negroes do not go to supper till late, and in order to amuse ourselves while our beef was preparing, a mandigo was desired to relate some diverting stories, in listening to which, and smoking tobacco, we spent three hours. These stories bear some resemblance to those in the Arabian Nights entertainments, but in general are of a more ludicrous cast. About one o'clock in the afternoon of the 3rd of December, I took my leave of Dr. Laidley and Mrs. Ainsley, and rode slowly into the woods. I had now before me a boundless forest, and a country, the inhabitants of which were strangers to civilized life, and to most of whom a white man was the object of curiosity or plunder. I reflected that I had parted from the last European I might probably behold, and perhaps quitted for ever the comforts of Christian society. Thoughts like these would necessarily cast a gloom over my mind, and I rode musing along for about three miles, when I was awakened from my reverie by a body of people, who came running up, and stopped the asses, giving me to understand that I must go with them to Pekaba to present myself to the king of Wali, or pay customs to them. I endeavored to make them comprehend that the object of my journey not being traffic, I ought not to be subjected to attacks like the Slatees, 
and other merchants who travel for gain but i reasoned to no purpose they said it was usual for travellers of all descriptions to make a present to the king of wally and without doing so i could not be permitted to proceed as they were more numerous than my attendants and withal very noisy i thought it prudent to comply with their demand and having presented them with four bars of tobacco for the king's use i was permitted to continue my journey and at sunset reached a village near kutakunda where we rested for the night in the morning of december fourth i passed kutakunda the last town of wali and stopped about an hour at a small adjoining village to pay customs to an officer of the king of wali as we rested the ensuing night at a village called tabajang and at noon the next day december fifth we reached medina the capital of the king of wali's dominions the kingdom of wali is bounded by wali on the west by the gambia on the south by the small river wali on the northwest by bondu on the northeast and on the east by the simbani wilderness the inhabitants are mandingos and like most of the mandingo nations are divided into two great sects the mohammedans who are called bushreens and the pagans who are called indiscriminately kafirs unbelievers and sonikis i e men who drink strong liquors the pagan natives are by far the most numerous and the government of the country is in their hands for though the most respectable among the bushreens are frequently consulted in affairs of importance yet they are never permitted to take any share in the executive government which rests solely in the hands of the mansa or sovereign and the great officers of the state of these the first in point of rank is the presumptive heir of the crown who is called the farbana next to him are the alcades or provincial governors who are most frequently called chemos then follow the two grand divisions of free men and slaves of the former the slatees so frequently mentioned in the preceding pages are considered as the principal but in all classes great respect is paid to the authority of aged men on the death of the reigning monarch his eldest son if he has attained the age of manhood succeeds to the regal authority if there is no son or if the son is under the age of discretion a meeting of the great men is held and the late monarch's nearest relation commonly his brother is called to the government not as regent or guardian to the infant son but in full right and to the exclusion of the minor the charges of the government are defrayed by occasional tributes from the people and by duties on goods transported across the country travelers on going from the gambia towards the interior pay customs in european merchandise on returning they pay in iron and shitolu these taxes are paid at every town medina the capital of the kingdom at which i was now arrived is a place of considerable extent and may contain from eight hundred to one thousand houses it is fortified in the common african manner by a surrounding high wall built of clay and an outward fence of pointed stakes and prickly bushes but the walls are neglected and the outward fence has suffered considerably from the active hands of busy housewives who pluck up the stakes for firewood i obtained a lodging at one of the king's near relations who apprised me that my introduction to the king i must not presume to shake hands with him it was not usual he said to allow this liberty to strangers thus instructed i went in the afternoon to pay my respects to the sovereign 
and asked permission to pass through his territories to Bondu. The king's name was Jatta. He was the same venerable old man of whom so favorable an account was transmitted by Major Houghton. I found him seated upon a mat before the door of his hut. A number of men and women were arranged on each side, who were singing and clapping their hands. I saluted him respectfully, and informed him of the purport of my visit. The king graciously replied that he not only gave me leave to pass through his country, but would offer up his prayers for my safety. On this, one of my attendants, seemingly in return for the king's condescension, began to sing, or rather to roar an Arabic song, at every pause of which the king himself and all the people present struck their hands against their foreheads and exclaimed, with devout and affecting solemnity, Amen, Amen. The king told me, furthermore, that I should have a guide the day following, who would conduct me safely to the frontier of his kingdom. I then took my leave, and in the evening sent the king an order upon Dr. Laidley for three gallons of rum, and received in return great store of provisions. December 6th. Early in the morning I went to the king a second time, to learn if the guide was ready. I found his majesty seated upon a bullock's hide, warming himself before a large fire, for the Africans are sensible of the smallest variation in the temperature of the air, and frequently complain of cold when a European is oppressed with heat. He received me with a benevolent countenance, and tenderly entreated me to desist from my purpose of traveling into the interior, telling me that Major Houghton had been killed in his route, and that if I followed his footsteps, I should probably meet with his fate. He said that I must not judge of the people of the eastern country by those of Woolly, that the latter were acquainted with white men and respected them, whereas the people of the east had never seen a white man and would certainly destroy me. I thanked the king for his affectionate solicitude, but told him that I considered the matter and was determined, notwithstanding all dangers, to proceed. The king shook his head, but desisted from further persuasion, and told me the guide should be ready in the afternoon. About two o'clock the guide appearing, I went and took my last farewell of the good old king, and in three hours reached Conjure, a small village, where we determined to rest for the night. Here I purchased a fine sheep for some beads, and my Sarah Woolley attendants killed it with all the ceremonies prescribed by their religion. Part of it was dressed for supper, after which a dispute arose between one of the Sarah Woolley Negroes and Johnson, my interpreter, about the sheep's horns. The former claimed the horns as his perquisite, for having acted the part of our butcher, and Johnson contested the claim. I settled the matter by giving a horn to each of them. This trifling incident is mentioned as introductory to what follows, for it appeared on inquiry that these horns were highly valued, as being easily convertible into portable sheaths or cases for containing and keeping secure certain charms or amulets called saffies, which the Negroes constantly wear about them. These saffies are prayers, or rather sentences, from the Koran, which the Mohammedan priests write on scraps of paper and sell to the simple natives who consider them to possess very extraordinary virtues. Some of the Negroes wear them to guard themselves against the bite of snakes or alligators, and on this occasion the safi is commonly enclosed in a snake or alligator skin and tied round the ankle. Others have recourse to them in time of war to protect their persons against hostile weapons. 
but the common use to which these amulets are applied is to prevent or cure bodily diseases to preserve from hunger and thirst and generally to conciliate the favor of superior powers under all the circumstances and occurrences of life in this case it is impossible not to admire the wonderful contagion of superstition for notwithstanding that the majority of the negroes are pagans and absolutely reject the doctrines of mohammed i did not meet with a man whether a bushreen or kaffir who was not fully persuaded of the powerful efficacy of these amulets the truth is that all the natives of this part of africa consider the art of writing as bordering on magic and it is not in the doctrines of the prophet but in the arts of the magician that their confidence is placed it will hereafter be seen that i was myself lucky enough in circumstances of distress to turn the popular credulity in this respect to good account on the seventh i departed from conjure and slept at a village called mala or maling and on the eighth about noon i arrived at Kalur, a considerable town near the entrance into which i observed hanging upon a tree a sort of masquerade habit made of the bark of trees which i was told on inquiry belonged to mumbo jumbo this is a strange bugbear common to all the mandigo towns and much employed by the pagan natives in keeping their women in subjection for as the kaffirs are not restricted in the number of their wives every one marries as many as he can conveniently maintain and as it frequently happens that the ladies disagree among themselves family quarrels sometimes rise to such a height that the authority of the husband can no longer preserve peace in his household in such cases the interposition of mumbo jumbo is called in and is always decisive this strange minister of justice who is supposed to be either the husband himself or some person instructed by him disguised in the dress that has been mentioned and armed with the rod of public authority announces his coming whenever his services are required by loud and dismal screams in the woods near the town he begins the pantomime at the approach of night and as soon as it is dark he enters the town and proceeds to the bentang at which all the inhabitants immediately assemble december ninth as there was no water to be procured on the road we travelled with great expedition until we reached tambacunda and departing from thence early the next morning the tenth we reached in the evening kunikari a town of nearly the same magnitude as kalor about noon on the eleventh we arrived at kujar the frontier town of woolly towards bondu from which it is separated by an interweaving wilderness of two days journey the guide appointed by the king of woolly being now to return i presented him with some amber for his trouble and having been informed that it was not possible at all times to procure water in the wilderness i made inquiry for men who would serve both as guides and water bearers during my journey across it three negroes elephant hunters offered their services for these purposes which i accepted and paid them three bars each in advance and the day being far spent i determined to pass the night in my present quarters the inhabitants of kujar though not wholly unaccustomed to the sight of europeans most of them having occasionally visited the countries of the gambia beheld me with a mixture of curiosity and reverence and in the evening invited me to see a neo-bearing or wrestling match 
at the bentang this is an exhibition very common in all the mandingo countries the spectators arrange themselves in a circle leaving the intermediate space for the wrestlers who were strong active young men full of emulation and accustomed i suppose from their infancy to this sort of exertion being stripped of their clothing except a short pair of drawers and having their skin anointed with oil or shea butter approached each other on all fours pairing with and occasionally extending a hand for some time till at length one of them sprang forward and caught his rival by the knee great dexterity and judgment were now displayed but the contest was decided by superior strength and i think that few europeans would have been able to cope with the conqueror it must not be unobserved that the combatants were animated by the music of a drum by which their actions were in some measure regulated the wrestling was succeeded by a dance in which many performers assisted all of whom were provided with little bells which were fastened to their legs and arms and here too the drum regulated their motions it was beaten with a crooked stick which the drummer held in his right hand occasionally using his left to deaden the sound and thus vary the music the drama is likewise applied on these occasions to keep order among the spectators by imitating the sound of certain mandingo sentences for example when the wrestling match is about to begin the drummer strikes what is understood to signify ali bo si sit all down upon which the spectators immediately seat themselves and when the combatants are to begin he strikes amuta amuta take hold take hold in the course of the evening i was presented by way of refreshment with a liquor which tasted so much like the strong beer of my native country and very good beer too as to induce me to inquire into its composition and i learnt with some degree of surprise that it was actually made from corn which had been previously malted much in the same manner as barley is malted in great britain a root yielding a grateful bitter was used in lieu of hops the name of which i have forgotten but the corn which yields the wort is the holcus sketus of botanists early in the morning the twelfth i found that one of the elephant hunters had absconded with the money he had received from me in part of wages and in order to prevent the other two from following his example i made them instantly fill their calabashes or gourds with water and as the sun rose i entered the wilderness that separates the kingdoms of woolly and bondu we continued our journey without stopping any more until noon when we came to a large tree called by the natives nemba taba it had a very singular appearance being decorated with innumerable rags or scraps of cloth which persons traveling across the wilderness had at different times tied to the branches probably at first to inform the traveler that water was to be found near it but the custom had been so greatly sanctioned by time that nobody now presumes to pass without hanging up something i followed the example and suspended a handsome piece of cloth on one of the boughs and being told that either a well or pool of water was at no great distance i ordered the negroes to unload the asses that we might give them corn and regale ourselves with the provisions we had brought in the meantime i sent one of the elephant hunters to look for the well intending if water was to be obtained to rest here for the night a pool was found but the water was thick and muddy and the negro discovered near it the remains of a fire recently extinguished 
and the fragments of provisions which afforded a proof that it had been lately visited either by travellers or banditti the fears of my attendants supposed the latter and believing that robbers lurked near as i was persuaded to change my resolution of resting here all night and proceed to another watering place which i was assured we might reach early in the evening we departed accordingly but it was eight o'clock at night before we came to the watering place and being now sufficiently fatigued with a long day's journey we kindled a large fire and lay down surrounded by our cattle on the bare ground more than a gunshot from any bush the negroes agreeing to keep watch by turns to prevent surprise i know not indeed that any danger was justly to be dreaded but the negroes were unaccountably apprehensive of banditti during the whole of the journey as soon therefore as daylight appeared we filled our soufrous skins and calabashes at the pool and set out for Talikia the first town in Bondu, which we reached about eleven o'clock in the forenoon, the 13th of December. Volume 1, Chapter 4 From Talika to Kaja Talika, the frontier town of Bondu, towards Wuli, is inhabited chiefly by Fulas of the Mohammedan region, who live in considerable affluence partly by furnishing provisions to the coffles or caravans that pass through the town and partly by the sale of ivory obtained by hunting elephants in which employment the young men are generally very successful here an officer belonging to the king of bondu constantly resides whose business it is to give timely information of the arrival of the caravans which are taxed according to the number of loaded asses that arrive at Talika. I took up my residence at this officer's house, and agreed with him to accompany me to Fataconda, the residence of the king, for which he was to receive five bars, and before my departure I wrote a few lines to Dr. Laidley, and gave my letter to the master of a caravan bound for the gambia this caravan consisted of nine or ten people with five asses loaded with ivory the large teeth are conveyed in nets two on each side of the ass the small ones are wrapped up in skins and secured with ropes december fourteenth we left talika and rode on very peacefully for about two miles when a violent quarrel arose between two of my fellow travellers one of whom was the blacksmith in the course of which they bestowed some opprobrious terms upon each other and it is worthy of remark that an african will sooner forgive a blow than a term of reproach applied to his ancestors strike me but do not curse my mother is a common expression even among the slaves this sort of abuse therefore so enraged one of the disputants that he drew his cutlass upon the blacksmith and would certainly have ended the dispute in a very serious manner if the others had not laid hold of him and wrestled the cutlass from him i was obliged to interfere and put an end to this disagreeable business by desiring the blacksmith to be silent and telling the other who i thought was in the wrong that if he attempted in future to draw his cutlass or molest any of my attendants i should look upon him as a robber and shoot him without further ceremony this threat had the desired effect and we marched sullenly along till the afternoon when we arrived at a number of small villages scattered over an open and fertile plain at one of these called ganado we took up our residence for the night here an exchange of presents and a good supper
terminated all animosities among my attendants and the night was far advanced before any of us thought of going to sleep we were amused by an itinerant singing man who told a number of diverting stories and played some sweet airs by blowing his breath upon a bow string and striking it at the same time with a stick december fifteenth at daybreak my fellow travellers the sarah woolies took leave of me with many prayers for my safety about a mile from gando we crossed a considerable branch of the gambia called nerco the banks were steep and covered with mimosas and i observed in the mud a number of large mussels but the natives do not eat them about noon the sun being exceedingly hot we rested two hours in the shade of a tree and purchased some milk and pounded corn from some fula herdsmen and at sunset reached a town called Kirkcarney, where the blacksmith had some relations and here we rested two days Corkinary is a mohammedan town surrounded by a high wall and is provided with a mosque here i was shown a number of arabic manuscripts particularly a copy of the book before mentioned called al shara the marabou or priest in whose possession it was read and explained to me in mandingo many of the most remarkable passages and in return i showed him richardson's arabic grammar which he very much admired on the evening of the second day december seventeenth we departed from Corkinari. we were joined by a young man who was travelling to fataconda for salt and as night set in we reached doggy a small village about three miles from Corkinari provisions here so cheap that i purchased a bullock for six small stones of amber for i found my company increase or diminish according to the good fare they met with december eighteenth early in the morning we departed from doggy and being joined by a number of fulas and other people made a formidable appearance and were under no apprehension of being plundered in the woods about eleven o'clock one of the asses proving very refractory the negroes took a courteous method to make him tractable they cut a forked stick and putting the forked part into the ass's mouth like the bit of a bridle tied the two smaller parts together above his head leaving the lower part of the stick a sufficient length to strike against the ground if the ass should attempt to put his head down after this the ass walked along quietly and gravely enough taking care after some practice to hold his head sufficiently high to prevent stones or roots of trees from striking against the end of the stick which experience had taught him would give a severe shock to his teeth this contrivance produced a ludicrous appearance but my fellow travellers told me it was constantly adapted by the slatees and always proved effectual in the evening we arrived at a few scattered villages surrounded with extensive cultivation at one of which called bugil we passed the night in a miserable hut having no other bed than a bundle of cornstalks and no provisions but we brought with us the wells here are dug with great ingenuity and are very deep i measured one of the bucket ropes and found the depth of the well to be twenty-eight fathoms december nineteenth we departed from bugali and travelled along a dry stony height covered with mimosas till midday when the land sloped towards the east and we descended into a deep valley in which i observed abundance of windstone and white quartz pursuing our course to the eastward along this valley in the bed of an exhausted river course we came to a large village where we intended to lodge we found many of the natives dressed in a thin french gauze which they called baiqui 
thus being a light airy dress as well calculated to display the shape of their persons is much esteemed by the ladies the manners of these females however did not correspond with their dress for they were rude and troublesome in the highest degree they surrounded me in numbers begging for amber beads etc and were so vehement in their solicitations that i found it impossible to resist them they tore my cloak cut the buttons from my boy's clothes and were proceeding to other outrages when i mounted my horse and rode off followed for half a mile by a body of these harpies in the evening we reached subrudoka and as my company was numerous being fourteen i purchased a sheep and abundance of corn for supper after which we lay down by the bundles and passed an uncomfortable night in a heavy dew december twentieth we departed from subrudoka and at two o'clock reached a large village situated on the banks of the falem river which is here rapid and rocky the natives were employed in fishing in various ways the large fish were taken in long baskets made of split cane and placed in a strong current which was created by walls of stone built across the stream certain open places being left though which the water rushed with great force some of these baskets were more than twenty feet long and once the fish had entered one of them the force of the stream prevented it from returning the small fish were taken in great numbers in hand nets which the natives weave of cotton and use with great dexterity the fish last mentioned are about the size of sprats and are prepared for sale in different ways the most common is by pounding them entire as they come from the stream in a wooden mortar and exposing them to dry in the sun in large lumps like sugar loaves it may be supposed that the smell is not very agreeable but in the moorish countries to the north of the senegal where fish is scarcely known this preparation is esteemed as a luxury and sold to considerable advantage the matter of using it by the natives is by dissolving a piece of this black loaf in boiling water and mixing it with their couscous on return to the village after an excursion to the riverside to inspect the fishery an old moor sheriff came to bestow his blessing upon me and begged some paper to write safis upon the man had seen major hooton in the kingdom of carta and told me that he died in the country of the moors about three in the afternoon we continued our course along the bank of the river to the northward till eight o'clock when we reached Naimau. here the hospital master of the town received us kindly and presented us with a bullock in return i gave him some amber and beads december twenty first in the morning having agreed for a canoe to carry over my bundles i crossed the river which came up to my knees as i sat on my horse but the water is so clear that from the high bank the bottom is visible all the way over about noon we entered fataconda the capital of bondu and in a little time received an invitation to the house of a respectable slati for as there are no public houses in africa it is customary for strangers to stand at the batang or some other place of public resort till they are invited to a lodging by some of the inhabitants we accepted the offer and in an hour afterwards a person came and told me he was sent on purpose to conduct me to the king who was very desirous of seeing me immediately if i was not too much fatigued i took my interpreter with me and followed the messenger till we got quite out of town and crossed some cornfields when suspecting some trick i stopped and asked the guide whither he was going 
upon which he pointed to a man sitting under a tree at some little distance and told me that the king frequently gave audience in that retired manner in order to avoid a crowd of people and that nobody but myself and my interpreter must approach him when i advanced the king desired me to come and sit by him upon the mat and after hearing my story on which b made no observation he asked if i wished to purchase any slaves or gold being answered in the negative he seemed rather surprised but desired me to come to him in the evening and he would give me some provisions this monarch was called alamani a moorish name though i was told he was not a mohammedan but a kaffir or pagan i had heard that he had acted towards major houghton with some unkindness and caused him to be plundered his behavior therefore towards myself at this interview though much more civil than i expected was far from freeing me from uneasiness i still apprehended some double dealing and as i was now entirely in his power i thought it best to smooth the way by a present accordingly i took with me in the evening one canister of gunpowder some amber tobacco and my umbrella and as i considered that my bundles would inevitably be searched i concealed some few articles in the roof of the hut where i lodged and put on my new blue coat in order to preserve it all the houses belonging to the king and his family are surrounded by a lofty mud wall which converts the whole into a kind of citadel the interior is subdivided into different courts at the first place of entrance i observed a man standing with a musket on his shoulder and i found the way to the presence very intricate leading through many passages with sentinels placed at the different doors when we came to the entrance of the court in which the king resides both my guide and my interpreter according to custom took off their sandals and the former pronounced the king's name aloud repeating it till he was answered from within we found the monarch sitting upon a mat and two attendants with him i repeated what i had before told him concerning the object of my journey and my reasons for passing through his country he seemed however but half satisfied when i offered to show him the contents of my portmanteau and everything belonging to me he was convinced and it was evident that his suspicion had arisen from a belief that every white man must of necessity be a traitor when i had delivered my presents he seemed well pleased and was particularly delighted with the umbrella which he repeatedly furled and unfurled to the great admiration of himself and his two attendants who could not for some time comprehend the use of this wonderful machine after this i was about to take my leave when the king desiring me to stop a while began a long preamble in favor of the whites extolling their immense wealth and good dispositions he next proceeded to an elogium on my blue coat of which the yellow buttons seemed particularly to catch his fancy and he concluded by entreating me to present him with it assuring me for my consolation under the loss of it that he would wear it on all public occasions and inform every one who saw it of my great liberality towards him the request of an african prince in his own dominions particularly when made to a stranger comes little short of a command it is only a way of obtaining by gentle means what he can if he pleases take by force and as it was against my interest to offend him by a refusal i very quietly took off my coat the only good one in my possession and laid it at his feet in return for my compliance he presented me with a great plenty of provisions 
and desired to see me again in the morning i accordingly attended and found in sitting upon his bed he told me he was sick and wished to have a little blood taken from him but i had no sooner tied up his arm and displayed the lancet than his courage failed and he begged me to postpone the operation till the afternoon as he felt himself he said much better than he had been and thanked me kindly for my readiness to serve him he then observed that his women were very desirous to see me and requested that i would favor them with the visit an attendant was ordered to conduct me and i had no sooner entered the court appropriated to the ladies than the whole seraglio surrounded me some begging for psychic some for amber and all of them desirous of trying that great african specific blood-letting they were ten or twelve in number most of them young and handsome and wearing on their heads ornaments of gold and beads of amber they rallied me with a good deal of gaiety on different subjects particularly upon the whiteness of my skin and the prominency of my nose they insisted they were both artificial the first they said was produced when i was an infant by dipping me in milk and they insisted that my nose had been pinched every day till it had acquired its present unsightly and unnatural conformation on my part without disputing my own deformity i paid them many compliments on african beauty i praised the glossy jet of their skins and the lovely depression of their noses but they said that flattery or as they emphatically termed it honeymouth was not esteemed in bondu in return however for my company or my compliments to which by the way they seemed not so insensible as they affected to be they presented me with a jar of honey and some fish which were sent to my lodging and i was desired to come again to the king's a little before sunset i carried with me some beads and writing paper it being usual to present some small offering on taking leave in return for which the king gave me five drums of gold observing that it was but a trifle and given out of pure friendship but would be of use to me in travelling for the purchase of provisions he seconded this act of kindness by one still greater politely telling me that though it was customary to examine the baggage of every traveller passing through his country yet in the present instance he would dispense without ceremony adding i was at liberty to depart when i pleased accordingly on the morning of the twenty-third we left fataconda and about eleven o'clock came to a small village where we determined to stop for the rest of the day in the afternoon my fellow travellers informed me that as this was the boundary between bondu and kaja and dangerous for travellers it would be necessary to continue our journey by night until we should reach a more hospitable part of the country i agreed to the proposal and hired two people for guides through the woods and as soon as the people of the village were gone to sleep the moon shining bright we set out the stillness of the air the howling of the wild beasts and the deep solitude of the forest made the scene solemn and oppressive not a word was uttered by any of us but in a whisper all were attentive and every one anxious to show his sagacity by pointing out to me the wolves and hyenas as they glided like shadows from one thicket to another towards morning we arrived at a village called kimu where our guides awakened one of their acquaintances and we stopped to give the asses some corn and roast a few ground nuts for ourselves at daylight we resumed our journey and in the afternoon arrived at jog in the kingdom of kaja being now in a country among a people differing in many respects 
from those that have as yet fallen under our observation i shall before i proceed further give some account of bondu the territory we have left and its inhabitants the fulas the description of whom i purposely reserve for this part of my work bondu is bound on the east by bambuk on the southeast and south by tenda and the simbani wilderness on the southwest by woolly and on the west by futa tora and on the north by kaja the country like that of woolly is very generally covered with woods but the land is more elevated and towards the Falme river rises into considerable hills its native fertility the soil is not surpassed i believe in any part of africa from the central situation of bondu between the gambia and senegal rivers it is become a place of great resort both for the slatees who generally pass through it on going from the coast to the interior countries and for occasional traders who frequently come hither from the inland countries to purchase salt these different branches of commerce are conducted principally by mandigos and sirawoolies who have settled in the country these merchants likewise carry on a considerable trade with the jedumua and other moorish countries bartering corn and blue cotton clothes for salt which they again barter in dentilla and other districts for iron shea butter and small quantities of gold dust they likewise sell a variety of sweet-smelling gums packed up in small bags containing each about a pound these gums being thrown on hot embers produce a very pleasant odor and are used by the mandingos for perfuming their huts and clothes the customs or duties on travelers are very heavy in almost every town an assload pays a bar of european merchandise and at fataconda the residence of the king one indian baft or a musket and six bottles of gunpowder are exacted as the common tribute by means of these duties the king of bondu is well supplied with arms and ammunition a circumstance which makes him formidable to the neighboring states the inhabitants differ in their complexions and national manners from the mandingos and sarawoolies with whom they are frequently at war some years ago the king of bondu crossed the falme river with a numerous army and after a short and bloody campaign totally defeated the forces of sambu king of bambuk who was obliged to sue for peace and surrender to him all the towns along the eastern bank of the falme the fulas in general as has been observed in a former chapter are of tawny complexion with small features and soft silky hair next to the mandingos they are undoubtedly the most considerable of all the nations in this part of africa their original country is said to be fuladu which signifies the country of the fulas but they possess at present many other kingdoms at a great distance from each other their complexion however is not exactly the same in the different districts in bondu and the other kingdoms which are situated in the vicinity of the moorish territories they are of a more yellow complexion than in the southern states the fulas of bondu are naturally of a mild and gentle disposition but the uncharitable maxims of the koran have made them less hospitable to strangers and more reserved in their behavior than the mandingos they evidently consider all the negro natives as their inferiors and when talking of different nations always rank themselves among the white people their government differs from that of the mandingos chiefly in this that they are more immediately under the influence of mohammedan laws 
for all the chief men the king excepted and a large majority of the inhabitants of bondu are mussulmans and the authority and laws of the prophet are everywhere looked upon as sacred and decisive in the exercise of their faith however they are not very intolerant towards such of their countrymen as still retain their ancient superstitions religious persecution is not known among them nor is it necessary for the system of mohammed is made to extend itself by means abundantly more efficacious by establishing small schools in the different towns where many of the pagan as well as the mohammedan children are taught to read the koran and instructed in the tenets of the prophet the mohammedan priests fix a bias on their minds and form the character of their young disciples which no accidents of life can ever afterward remove or alter many of these little schools i visited in my progress through the country and i observed with pleasure the great docility and submissive deportment of the children and heartily wished they had better instructors and a pure religion with the mohammedan faith is also introduced the arabic language with which most of the fulas have a slight acquaintance their native tongue abounds very much in liquids but there is something unpleasant in the manner of pronouncing it a stranger on hearing the common conversation of two fulas would imagine that they were scolding each other their numerals are these one go two d d three tete four knee five jewy six jago seven jadidi eight jateti nine jani ten sapo the industry of the fulas in the occupations of pasturage and agriculture is everywhere remarkable even on the banks of the gambia the greater part of the corn is raised by them and their herds and flocks are more numerous and in better condition than those of the mandingos but in bondu they are opulent in a high degree and enjoy all the necessities of life in the greatest profusion they display great skill in the management of their cattle making them extremely gentle by kindness and familiarity on the approach of the night they are collected from the woods and secured in folds called karees which are constructed in the neighborhood of the different villages in the middle of each karee is erected a small hut wherein one or two of the herdsmen keep watch during the night to prevent the cattle from being stolen and to keep up the fires which are kindled round the koree to frighten away wild beasts the cattle are milked in the mornings and evenings the milk is excellent but the quantity obtained from one any one cow is by no means so great as in europe the fulas use the milk chiefly as an article of diet and that not until it is quite sour the cream which it affords is very thick and is converted into butter by stirring it violently in a large calabash this butter when melted over a gentle fire is freed from impurities is preserved in small earthen pots and forms a part in most of their dishes it serves likewise to anoint their heads and is bestowed very liberally on their faces and arms but although milk is plentiful it is somewhat remarkable that the fulas and indeed all the inhabitants of this part of africa are totally unacquainted with the art of making cheese a firm attachment to the customs of their ancestors makes them view with an eye of prejudice everything that looks like innovation the heat of the climate and the great scarcity of salt are held forth as unanswerable objections and the whole process appears to them too long and troublesome to be attended with any solid advantage 
besides the cattle which constitute the chief wealth of the fulas they possess some excellent horses the breed of which seems to be a mixture of the arabian with the original african volume one chapter five from kaja to kassan the kingdom of kaja in which i was now arrived is called by the french gallum but the name that i have adopted is universally used by the natives this country is bounded on the southeast and south by bambuk on the west by bondu and futa terra and on the north by the river senegal the air and climate are i believe more pure and salubrious than at any of the settlements towards the coast the face of the country is everywhere interspersed with a pleasing variety of hills and valleys and the windings of the senegal river which descends from the rocky hills of the interior make the scenery on its bank very picturesque and beautiful the inhabitants are called sarah woolies or as the french write it sarah cotlets their complexion is a jet black they are not to be distinguished in this respect from the jalofs the government is monarchical and the regal authority from what i experienced of it seems to be sufficiently formidable the people themselves however complain of no oppression and seemed all very anxious to support the king in a contest he was going to enter into with the sovereign of Kasson. the serawillies are habitually a trading people they formerly carried on a great commerce with the french in gold and slaves and still maintain some traffic in slaves with the british factories on the gambia they are reckoned tolerably fair and just in their dealings but are indefatigable in their exertions to acquire wealth and they derive considerable profits from the sale of salt and cotton cloth in distinct countries when a sarah woolly merchant returns home from a trading expedition the neighbors immediately assemble to congratulate him upon his arrival on these occasions the traveler displays his wealth and liberality by making a few presents to his friends but if he has been unsuccessful his levy is soon over and every one looks upon him as a man of no understanding who could perform a long journey and as they express it bring back nothing but the hair upon his head their language abounds much in gutturals and is not so harmonious as that spoken by the fulas it is however well worth acquiring by those who travel through this part of the african continent in being very generally understood in the kingdoms of Kasson, carta ludamar and the northern parts of bambara in all these countries the sarah woolies are the chief traders their numerals are one bani two philo three sicko four narito five carago six tumo seven nero eight sego nine cabo ten tamo twenty tamo di philo we arrived at joag the frontier town of this kingdom on the twenty fourth of december and took up our residence at the house of the chief man who is here no longer known by that title of al kid but is called the duty he was a rigid mohammedan but distinguished for his hospitality this town may be supposed on a gross computation to contain two thousand inhabitants it is surrounded by a high wall in which are a number of portholes for musketry to fire through in case of attack every man's possession is likewise surrounded by a wall the whole forming so many distinct citadels and amongst a people unacquainted with the use of artillery these walls answer all the purposes of strong fortifications to the westward of the town is a small river on the banks of which the natives raise great plenty of tobacco and onions 
the same evening madabu the bushreen who had accompanied me from pisania went to pay a visit to his father and mother who dwelt at a neighboring town called dramnet he was joined by my other attendant the blacksmith as soon as it was dark i was invited to see the sports of the inhabitants it being their custom on the arrival of strangers to welcome them by diversions of different kinds i found a great crowd surrounding a party who were dancing by the light of some large fires to the music of four drums which were beat with great exactness and uniformity the dances however consisted more in wanton gestures than in muscular exertion or graceful attitudes the ladies vied with each other in displaying the most voluptuous movements imaginable december twenty fifth at about two o'clock in the morning a number of horsemen came into the town and having awakened my landlord talked to him for some time in the sarah woolly tongue after which they dismounted and came to the bentang on which i had made my bed one of them thinking that i was asleep attempted to steal the musket that lay by me on the mat but finding that he could not effect his purpose undiscovered he desisted and the stranger sat down by me till daylight i could now easily perceive by the countenance of my interpreter johnson that something very unpleasant was in agitation i was likewise surprised to see mandibu and the blacksmith so soon return on inquiring the reason mandibu informed me that as they were dancing at dramat ten horsemen belonging to Bachiri, king of the country with his second son at their head had arrived there inquiring if the white men had passed and on being told that i was at jog they rode off without stopping madibu added that on hearing this he and the blacksmith hastened back to give me notice of their coming whilst i was listening to this narrative the ten horsemen mentioned by madibu arrived and coming to the bentang dismounted and seated themselves with those who had come before the whole being about twenty in number forming a circle round me and each man holding his musket in his hand i took this opportunity to observe to my landlord that as i did not understand the sarah woolly tongue i hoped whatever the men had to say they would speak in mandigo to this they agreed and a short man loaded with a remarkable number of saffies opened the business in a very long harangue informing me that i had entered the king's town without having first paid the duties or giving any present to the king and that according to the laws of the country my people cattle and baggage were forfeited he added that they had received orders from the king to conduct me to mana the place of his residence and if i refused to come with them their orders were to bring me by force upon his saying which all of them rose up and asked me if i was ready i would have been equally vain and imprudent in me to have resisted or irritated such a body of men i therefore affected to comply with their commands and begged them only to stop a little until i had given my horse a feed of corn and settled matters with my landlord the poor blacksmith who was a native of casson mistook this feigned compliance for a real intention and taking me away from the company told me that he had always behaved towards me as if i had been his father and master and he hoped i would not entirely ruin him by going to mana adding that as there was every reason to believe a war would soon take place between casson and kanja he should not only lose his little property the savings of four years industry but should certainly be detained and sold as a slave unless his friends had an opportunity of paying two slaves for his redemption i saw this reasoning in its full force and determined to do my utmost to preserve the blacksmith from so dreadful a fate i therefore told the king's son that i was ready to go with him 
upon condition that the blacksmith who was an inhabitant of a distant kingdom and entirely unconnected with me should be allowed to stay at jog till my return to this they all objected and insisted that as we had all acted contrary to the laws we were all equally answerable for our conduct i now took my landlord aside and giving him a small present of gunpowder asked his advice in such critical a situation he was decidedly of an opinion that i ought not to go to the king he was fully convinced he said that if the king should discover anything valuable in my possession he would not be over scrupulous about the means of obtaining it toward the evening as i was sitting upon the bentang chewing straws an old female slave passing by with a basket upon her head asked me if i had got my dinner as i thought she only laughed at me i gave her no answer but my boy who was sitting close by answered for me and told her that the king's people had robbed me of all my money on hearing this the good old woman with a look of unaffected benevolence immediately took the basket from her head and showing me that it contained ground nuts asked me if i could eat them being answered in the affirmative she presented me with a few handfuls and walked away before i had time to thank her for this seasonable supply the old woman had scarcely left when i received information that a nephew of demba sego jala the mandigo king of kasson was coming to pay me a visit he had been sent on an embassy to Bacheri, king of kajaja to endeavor to settle the disputes which had risen between his uncle and the latter but after debating the matter four days without success he was now on his return and hearing that a white man was at jog on his way to Casson, curiosity brought in to see me i represented to him my situation and distresses which he frankly offered me his protection and said he would be my guide to Casson provided i was set out the next morning and be answerable for my safety i readily and gratefully accepted his offer and was ready with my attendance by daylight on the morning of the twenty seventh of december my protector whose name was demba sego probably after his uncle had a numerous retinue our company at leaving jog consisted of thirty persons and six loaded asses and we rode on cheerfully enough for some hours without any remarkable occurrence until we came to a species of tree for which my interpreter johnson had made frequent inquiry on finding it he desired us to stop and producing a white chicken which he had purchased a jog for the purpose he tied it by the leg to one of the branches and then told us we might now safely proceed for that our journey would be prosperous at noon we had reached gangadi a large town where we stopped about an hour until some of the asses that had fallen behind came up here i observed a number of date trees and a mosque built of clay with six turrets on the pinnacles of which were placed six ostrich eggs a little before sunset we arrived at the town of sami on the banks of the senegal which is here a beautiful but shallow river moving slowly over a bed of sand and gravel the banks are high and covered with verdure the country is open and cultivated and the rocky hills of fellow and bambuk add much to the beauty of the landscape december twenty eighth we departed from sami and arrived in the afternoon at kei a large village part of which is situated on the north and part of the south side of the river the ferryman then taking hold of the most steady of the horses by a rope led him into the water and paddled the canoe a little from the brink upon which a general attack commenced upon the other horses who finding themselves pelted and kicked on all sides 
unanimously plunged into the river and followed their companion a few boys swam in after them and by laving water upon them while they attempted to return urged them onwards and we had the satisfaction in about fifteen minutes to see them all safe on the other side it was a matter of great difficulty to manage the asses their natural stubbornness of disposition made them endure a great deal of pelting and shoving before they would venture into the water and when they had reached the middle of the stream four of them turned back in spite of every exertion to get them forwards two hours were spent in getting the whole of them over an hour more was employed in transporting the baggage and it was nearly sunset before the canoe returned when demba sago and myself embarked in this dangerous passage boat which the least motion was like to overset the king's nephew thought this a proper time to have a peep in a tin box of mine that stood in the fore part of the canoe and in stretching out his hand for it he unfortunately destroyed the equilibrium and overset the canoe luckily we were not far advanced and got back to the shore without much difficulty from whence after wringing the water from her clothes we took a fresh departure and were soon afterwards safety landed in Casson. volume one chapter six tiggity seagull's palver we no sooner found ourselves safe in Casson than demba sago told me that we were now in his uncle's dominions and he hoped i would consider being now out of danger the obligation i owed to him and make him a suitable return for the trouble he had taken on my account by a handsome present this as he knew how much had been pilfered from me at jog was rather an unexpected proposition and i began to fear that i had not much improved my condition by crossing the water but as it would have been folly to complain i made no observation upon his conduct and gave him seven bars of amber and some tobacco with which he seemed to be content after a long day's journey in the course of which i observed a number of large loose nodules of white granite we arrived at t c on the evening of december twenty ninth and were accommodated in dembo sego's hut the next morning he introduced me to his father tiggity sego brother to the king of casson chief of t c the old man viewed me with great earnestness having never he said beheld but one might man before whom by his description i immediately knew to be major hooton in the afternoon one of his slaves eloped and a general alarm being given every person that had a horse rode into the woods and in the hopes of apprehending him and demba sego begged the use of my horse for the same purpose i readily consented and in about an hour they all returned with the slave who was severely flogged and afterwards put in irons on the day following december thirty first dembo sego was ordered to go with twenty horsemen to a town in gedemua to adjust some dispute with the moors a party of whom were supposed to have stolen three horses from tessi demba begged a second time use of my horse adding that the sight of my bridle and saddle would give him consequence among the moors this request also i readily granted and he promised to return at the end of three days during his absence i amused myself with walking about the town and conversing with the natives who attended me everywhere with great kindness and curiosity and supplied me with milk eggs and what other provisions i wanted on very easy terms to see is a large unwalled town having no security against attack of an enemy except a sort of citadel in which tickety 
and his family constantly reside this town according to the report of the natives was formerly inhabited only by a few fula shepherds who lived in considerable affluence by means of the excellent meadows in the neighborhood in which they reared great herds of cattle but their prosperity attracted the envy of some mandingoes the latter drove out the shepherds and took possession of their lands the present inhabitants though they possess both cattle and corn in abundance are not over nice in articles of diet rats moles squirrels snakes locusts are eaten without scruple by the highest and lowest my people were one evening invited to a feast given by some of the townsmen where after making a hearty meal of what they thought fish and couscous one of them found a piece of hard skin in the dish and brought it along with him to show me what sort of fish they had been eating on examining the skin i found they had been feasting on a large snake another custom still more extraordinary is that no woman is allowed to eat an egg this prohibition whether arising from ancient superstition or from the craftiness of some old bushreen who loved eggs himself is rigidly adhered to and nothing will more affront a woman of to see than to offer her an egg the custom is the more singular as the men eat eggs without scruple in the presence of their wives and i never observed the same prohibition in any other of the mandigo countries the third day after his son's departure tickety sego held a palver on a very extraordinary occasion which i attended and the debates on both sides of the question displayed much ingenuity the case was this a young man a kaffir of considerable affluence who had recently married a young and handsome wife applied to a very devout bushreen or mussulman priest of his acquaintance to procure him safis for his protection during the approaching war the bushreen complied with the request and in order he pretended to render the safis more efficacious and joining the young man to avoid any nuptial intercourse with his bride for the space of six weeks severe as the injunction was the kaffir strictly obeyed and without telling his wife the real cause absented himself from her company in the meantime it began to be whispered at to see that the bushreen who always performed his evening devotions at the door of the kaffir's hut was more intimate with the young wife than he ought to be at first the good husband was unwilling to suspect the honor of his sanctified friend and one whole month elapsed before any jealousy rose in his mind but hearing the charge repeated he at last interrogated his wife on the subject who frankly confessed that the bushreen had seduced her hereupon the kaffir put her in confinement and called a palver upon the bushreen's conduct the fact was clearly proved against him and he was sentenced to be sold into slavery or to find two slaves for his redemption according to the pleasure of the complainant the injured husband however was unwilling to proceed against his friend to such extremity and desired rather to have him publicly flogged before tigiti sego's gate this was agreed to and the sentence was immediately executed the culprit was tied by the hands to a strong stake and a long black rod being brought forth the executioner after flourishing it round his head for some time applied it with such force and dexterity to the bushreen's back as to make him roar until the woods resounded with his screams the surrounding multitude by their hooting and laughing manifested how much they enjoyed the punishment of this old gallant and it is worthy of remark that the number of stripes was precisely the same as are enjoyed by the mosaic law forty save one 
as there appeared great probability that Tassi, from its being a frontier town would be much exposed during the war to the predatory incursions of the moors of Genmaya, tickety sago had before my arrival sent round to the neighboring villages to beg or to purchase as much provisions as would afford subsistence to the inhabitants for one whole year independently of the crop on the ground which the moors might destroy the project was well received by the country people and they fixed a day on which to bring all the provisions they could spare to to see and as my horse was not yet returned i went in the afternoon of january fourth seventeen ninety six to meet the escort with the provisions it was composed of about four hundred men marching in good order with corn and ground nuts in large calabashes upon their heads they were preceded by a strong guard of bowmen and followed by eight musicians or singing men as soon as they approached the town the latter began a song every verse of which was answered by the company and succeeded by a few strokes on the large drums in this manner they proceeded amidst the acclamations of the populace till they reached the house of tiggity sego where the loads were deposited and in the evening they all assembled under the bentang tree and spent the night in dancing and merriment on the fifth of january an embassy of ten people belonging to alamami abdul Kader, king of futa tora a country to the west of bondu arrived at tassi and desiring tiggity to call an assembly of all the inhabitants announced publicly their king's determination to this effect that unless all the people of kasson would embrace the mohammedan religion and evince their conversion by saying eleven public prayers he the king of futa tora could not possibly stand neuter in the present contest but would certainly join his arms to those of kaja a message of this nature from so powerful a prince could not fail to create great alarm and the inhabitants of tassi after a long consultation agreed to conform to his good pleasure humiliating as it was to them accordingly one and all publicly offered up eleven prayers which were considered a sufficient testimony of their having renounced paganism and embraced the doctrines of the prophet it was time eighth of january before demba sego returned with my horse and being quite wearied out with the delay i went immediately to inform his father that i should set out for kunikari early the next day the old man made many frivolous objections and at length gave me to understand that i must not think of departing without first paying him the same duties he was entitled to receive from all travellers besides which he expected he said some acknowledgment for his kindness towards use accordingly on the morning of the ninth my friend demba with a number of people came to me and said that they were sent by tiggity sego for my present and wished to see what goods i had appropriated for that purpose i knew that resistance was hopeless and complaint unavailing and being in some measure prepared by the intimidation i had received the night before i quietly offered him seven bars of amber and five of tobacco after surveying these articles for some time very coolly demba laid them down and told me that this was not a present for a man of tiggity sego's consequence who had it in his power to take whatever he pleased from me he added that if i did not consent to make him a larger offering he would carry all my baggage to his father and let him choose for himself i had no time for reply 
for demba and his attendants immediately began to open my bundles and spread the different articles upon the floor where they underwent a more strict examination than they had done at joag everything that pleased them they took without scruple and amongst other things demba seized the tin box that had so much attracted his attention in crossing the river upon collecting the scattered remains of my little fortune after these people had left me i found that as at joag i had been plundered of half so here without even the shadow of accusation i was deprived of half the remainder the blacksmith himself though a native of casson had also been compelled to open his bundles and take an oath that the different articles they contained were his own exclusive property there was however no remedy and having been under the same obligation to demba sigo for his attention towards me in the journey from joag i did not reproach him for his rapacity but determined to quit to see at all events the next morning in the meanwhile in order to raise the drooping spirits of my attendants i purchased a fat sheep and had it dressed for our dinner early in the morning of january tenth therefore i left to see and about midday ascended a ridge from whence we had a distant view of the hills round kunakari in the evening we reached a small village where we slept and departing from thence the next morning crossed in a few hours a narrow but deep stream called Creco, a branch of the senegal about two miles farther to the eastward we passed a large town called madina and at two o'clock came in sight of jumbo the blacksmith's native town from whence he had been absent more than four years soon after this his brother who had by some means been apprised of his coming came out to meet him accompanied by a singing man he brought a horse for the blacksmith that he might enter his native town in a dignified manner and he desired each of us to put a good charge of powder into our guns the singing man now led the way followed by the two brothers and we were presently joined by a number of people from the town all of whom demonstrated great joy at seeing their old acquaintance the blacksmith by the most extravagant jumping and singing on entering the town the singing man began an extemporary song in praise of the blacksmith extolling his courage in having overcome so many difficulties and concluding with a strict injunction to his friends to dress him plenty of victuals when we arrived at the blacksmith's place of residence we dismounted and fired our muskets the meeting between him and his relatives was very tender for these rude children of nature free from restraint display their emotions in the strongest and most expressive manner amid these transports the blacksmith's aged mother was led forth leaning upon a staff every one made way for her and she stretched out her hand to bid her son welcome being totally blind she stroked his hands arms and face with great care and seemed highly delighted that her latter days were blessed by his return and that her ears once more heard the music of his voice during the tumult of these congratulations i had seated myself apart by the side of one of the huts being unwilling to interrupt the flow of filial and parental tenderness and the attention of the company was so entirely taken up with the blacksmith that i believed none of his friends had observed me when all the people present had seated themselves the blacksmith was desired by his father to give them some account of his adventures and silence being commanded he began and after repeatedly thanking god for the success that had attended him related every material occurrence that had happened to him from his leasing casson to his arrival at gambia 
his employment and success in those parts and the dangers that he had escaped in returning to his native country in the latter part of his narration he had frequently occasion to mention me and after many strong expressions concerning my kindness to him he pointed to the place where i sat and exclaimed a phil ebi suring see him sitting there in a moment all eyes were turned upon me i appeared like a being dropped from the clouds every one was surprised that they had not observed me before and a few women and children expressed great uneasiness at being so near a man of such an uncommon appearance by degrees however their apprehensions subsided and when the blacksmith assured them that i was perfectly inoffensive and would hurt nobody some of them ventured so far as to examine the texture of my clothes but many of them were still very suspicious and when by accident i happened to move myself or look at the young children their mothers would scamper off with them with the greatest precipitations in a few hours however they all became reconciled to me with these worthy people i spent the remainder of that and the whole of the ensuing day in feasting and merriment and the blacksmith declared he would not quit me during my stay at kunikari for which place we set out early on the morning of the fourteenth of january and arrived about the middle of the day at solu a small village three miles to the south of it as this place was somewhat out of the direct road it is necessary to observe that i went thither to visit a slattee or gambia trader of great note and reputation named salim dokari he is well known to dr laidley who had trusted him with the effects to the value of five slaves and had given me an order for the whole of the debt we luckily found him at home and he received me with great kindness and attention it is remarkable however that the king of Casson was by some means immediately apprised of my motions for i had been at solu but a few hours before sambo sego his second son came thither with a party of horse to inquire what had prevented me from proceeding to kukenteri and waiting immediately upon the king who he said was impatient to see me salem dakari made my apology and promised to accompany me to kun akari the same evening we accordingly departed from solu at sunset and in about an hour entered kukenkari but as the king had gone to sleep we deferred the interview till next morning and slept at the hut of sambo sego volume one chapter seven interview with king demba sego jala about eight o'clock in the morning of january the fifteenth seventeen ninety six we went to an audience of the king dembo sego jala but the crowd of people to see me was so great that i could scarcely get admittance a passage being at length obtained i made my bow to the monarch whom we found sitting upon a mat in a large hut he appeared to be a man of about sixty years of age his success in war and the mildness of his behavior in time of peace had much endeared him to all his subjects he studied me with great attention and when salim dakari explained to him the object of my journey and my reasons for passing through his country the good old king appeared not only perfectly satisfied but promised me every assistance in his power he informed me that he had seen major hooton and presented him with a white horse but that after crossing the kingdom of carta he had lost his life among the moors in what manner he could not inform me when this audience was ended we returned to our lodging and they made up a small present for the king 
out of the few effects that were left me for i had not yet received anything from salem ducari the present though inconsiderable in itself was well received by the king who sent me in return a large white bullock the sight of the animal quite delighted my attendants not so much on account of its bulk but from it being of white color which is considered as a particular mark of favor but although the king himself was well disposed towards me and readily granted me permission to pass through his territories i soon discovered that very great and unexpected obstacles were likely to impede my progress besides the war which was on the point of breaking out between Kassan and Kajja, i was told that the next kingdom of Karta, through which my route lay was involved in the issue and was furthermore threatened with hostilities on the part of bambara the king himself informed me of these circumstances and advised me to stay in the neighborhood of kunikari till such time as he could procure proper information respecting bambara which he expected to do in the course of four or five days as he had already he said sent four messengers into Karta for that purpose i readily submitted to his this proposal and went to solu to stay there till the return of one of those messengers this afforded me a favorable opportunity of receiving what money salim ducari could spare me on dr laidley's account i succeeded in receiving the value of the slaves chiefly in gold dust and being anxious to proceed as quickly as possible i begged ducari to use his interest with the king to allow me a guide by the way of fuladu as i was informed that the war had already commenced between the kings of bambara and Karta, ducari accordingly set out for kukinkari on the morning of the twentieth and the same evening returned with the king's answer which was to this purpose that the king had many years ago made an agreement with daisy king of Karta, to send all merchants and travellers through his dominions but that if i wished to take that route through fuladu i had his permission so to do though he could not consistently with his agreement lend me a guide having felt the want of regal protection in a former part of my journey i was unwilling to hazard a repetition of the hardships i had then experienced especially as the money i had received was probably the last supply that i should obtain i therefore determined to wait for the return of the messengers from Karta. in the interim it began to be whispered abroad that i had received plenty of gold from salim ducari and on the morning of the twenty-third sambo sago paid me a visit with a party of horsemen he insisted upon knowing the exact amount of the money i had obtained declaring that whatever the sum was one half of it must go to the king besides which he intimidated that he expected a handsome present for himself as being the king's son and for his attendants as being the king's relations i prepared to submit and if salim Dakari had not interposed all my endeavors to mitigate this oppressive claim would have been to no avail salim at last prevailed upon sambo to accept sixteen bars of european merchandise and some powder and a ball as a complete payment of every demand that could be made upon me in the kingdom of Kassan. january twenty sixth in the forenoon i went to the top of a high hill to the southward of solu where i had the most enchanting prospect of the country the number of towns and villages and the extensive cultivation around them surpassed everything i had yet seen in africa a gross calculation may be formed of the number of inhabitants in this delightful plain 
by considering that the king of Casson can raise four thousand fighting men by the sound of his war drum in traversing the rocky eminences of this hill which are almost destitute of vegetation i observed a number of large holes in the crevasses and fissures of the rocks where the wolves and hyenas take refuge during the day february first the messengers arrived from carta and brought intelligence that the war had not yet commenced between bambara and carta and i might probably pass through carta before the bambara army invaded that country february third early in the morning two guides on horseback came from kukinteri to conduct me to the frontiers of carta i accordingly took leave of salem dukari and parted for the last time from my fellow traveller the blacksmith whose kind solicitude for my welfare had been so conspicuous and about ten o'clock departed from solu we travelled this day through a rocky and hilly country along the banks of the river creco and at sunset came to the village of somu where we slept february fourth we departed from somu and continued our route along the banks of the creco which are everywhere well cultivated and swarm with inhabitants at this time they were increased by the number of people that had flown thither from carta on account of the bambara war in the afternoon we reached kimbo a large village the residence of madi conko governor of the hilly country of Kassan, which is called soroma from hence the guides appointed by the king of Kassan returned to join in the expedition against kajaja and i waited until the sixth before i could prevail on madi conko to appoint me a guide to carta february seventh departing kimbo with madi conko's son as a guide we continued our course along the banks of the creco until the afternoon when we arrived at kanji a considerable town the creco is here but a small rivulet the beautiful stream takes the rise a little to the eastward of this town and descends with a rapid and noisy current until it reaches the bottom of the high hill called tapa where it becomes more placid and winds gently through the lovely plains of kunikari after which having received an additional branch from the north it is lost in the senegal somewhere near the falls of fellow february eighth this day we travelled over a rough stony country and having passed sipo and a number of other villages arrived in the afternoon at lac arago a small village which stands upon the ridge of hills that separates the kingdoms of Kassan and carta in the course of the day we passed many hundreds of people flying from carta with their families and effects february ninth early in the morning we departed from lac argo and a little to the eastward came to the brow of a hill from whence we had an extensive view of the country towards the southeast were perceived some very distant hills which our guide told us were the mountains of fuladu we travelled with great difficulty down a stony and abrupt precipice and continued our way in the bed of a dry river course where the trees meeting overhead made the place dark and cool in a little time we reached the bottom of this romantic glen and about ten o'clock emerged from between two rocky hills and found ourselves on the level and sandy plains of carta at noon we arrived at Cori, or a watering place where for a few strings of beads i purchased as much milk and cornmeal as we could eat indeed provisions here so cheap and the shepherds live in such affluence that they seldom ask any return for what refreshments a traveller receives from them from this Cori, we reached fesura at sunset 
where we took up our lodging for the night february tenth we continued at festura all this day to have a few clothes washed and learn more exactly the situation of affairs before we ventured towards the capital february eleventh our landlord taking advantage of the unsettled state of the country demanded so extravagant a sum for our lodging that suspecting he wished for an opportunity to quarrel with us i refused to submit to his exorbitant demand but my attendants were so much frightened at the reports of approaching war that they refused to proceed any farther unless i could settle matters with him and induce him to accompany us to camus for our protection on the road this i accomplished with some difficulty and by a present of a blanket which i had brought with me to sleep in and for which our landlord had conceived a very great liking matters were at length amiably adjusted and he mounted his horse and led the way he was one of those negroes who together with the ceremonial part of the mohammedan religion retained all their ancient superstitions and even drink strong liqueurs they are called johars or jowers and in this kingdom form a very numerous and powerful tribe we had no sooner got into a dark need lonely part of the first wood than he made a sign for us to stop and taking hold of a hollow piece of bamboo that hung as an amulet round his neck whistled very loud three times i confess i was somewhat startled thinking it was a signal for some of his companions to come and attack us but he assured me that it was done merely with a view to ascertain what success we were likely to meet with on our present journey he then dismounted laid his spear across the road and having said a number of short prayers concluded with three loud whistles after which he listened for some time as if in expectation of an answer and received none told us we might proceed without fear for there was no danger about noon we passed a number of large villages quite deserted the inhabitants having fled into Cassan to avoid the horrors of war we reached Karankala at sunset this formerly was a large town but having been plundered by the barbarians about four years ago nearly one half of it is still in ruins february twelfth at daylight we departed Karankala, and as it was but a short day's journey to Kemu, we travelled slower than usual and amused ourselves by collecting such eatable fruits as grew near the roadside about noon we saw at a distance the capital of carta situated in the middle of an open plain the country for two miles round being cleared of wood by the great consumption of that article for building and fuel and we entered the town about two o'clock in the afternoon we proceeded without stopping to the court before the king's residence but i was so completely surrounded by the gazing multitude that i did not attempt to dismount but sent in the landlord and matty conky's son to acquaint the king of my arrival in a little time they returned accompanied by a messenger from the king signifying that he would like to see me in the evening and in the meantime the messenger had orders to procure me a lodging and see that the crowd did not molest me he conducted me into a court at the door of which he stationed a man with a stick in his hand to keep off the mob and then showed me a large hut in which i was to lodge i had scarcely seated myself in this spacious apartment when the mob entered it was found impossible to keep them out and i was surrounded by as many as the hut could contain when the first party however had seen me and asked a few questions they retired to make room for another company and in this manner the hut was filled and emptied thirteen different times 
a little before sunset the king sent to inform me that he was at leisure and wished to see me i followed the messenger through a number of courts surrounded with high walls where i observed plenty of dry grass bundled up like hay to fodder the horses in case a town should be invested on entering the court in which the king was sitting i was astonished at the number of his attendants and at the good order that seemed to prevail among them they were all seated the fighting men on the king's right and the women and children on the left leaving a space between them for my passage the king whose name was daisy Korabari, was not to be distinguished from his subjects by any superiority in point of dress a bank of earth about two feet high upon which was spread a leopard skin constituted the only mark of royal dignity when i had seated myself upon the ground before him and related the various circumstances that induced me to pass through his country and my reasons for soliciting his protections he appeared perfectly satisfied but said it was not in his power at present to afford me much assistance for that all sort of communication between carta and bambara had been interrupted for some time past and as masong the king of bambara with his army had entered fuladu in his way to carta there was little hope of my reaching bambara by any of the usual routes inasmuch as coming from an enemy's country i should certainly be plundered or taken for a spy if his country had been at peace he said i might have remained with him until a more favorable opportunity offered but as matters stood at present he did not wish me to continue in carta for fear some accident should befall me in which case my countrymen might say that he had murdered a white man he would therefore advise me to return into casson and remain there until the war should terminate which would probably happen in the course of three or four months after which if he was alive he said he would be glad to see me and if he was dead his sons would take care of me this advice was certainly well meant on the part of the king and perhaps i was to blame for not following it but i reflected that the hot months were approaching and i dreaded the thought of spending the rainy season in the interior of africa these considerations and the aversion i felt at the idea of returning without having made a greater progress in discovery made sue determined to go forward and though the king could not give me a guide to bambara i begged that he would allow a man to accompany me as near the frontier of his kingdom as was consistent with safety finding that i was determined to proceed the king told me that one route still remained but that he said was by no means free from danger which was to go from carta into the moorish kingdom of ludamar from whence i might pass by a circuitous route into pambara if i wished to follow this route he would appoint people to conduct me to jara the frontier town of ludamar he then inquired very particularly how i had been treated since i had left the gambia and asked in a jocular way how many slaves i expected to carry home with me on my return he was about to proceed when a man mounted on a fine moorish horse which was covered with sweat and foam entered the court and signifying that he had something of importance to communicate the king immediately took up his sandals which is the signal to strangers to retire i accordingly took leave but desired my boy to stay about the place in order to learn something of the intelligence that this messenger had brought in about an hour the boy returned and informed me that the bambara army had left fulalu and was on its march towards carta 
and the man I had seen, who had brought this intelligence, was one of the scouts, or watchmen, employed by the king, each of whom has his particular station, commonly on the same rising ground, from whence he has the best view of the country, and watches the motions of the enemy. February 13th. At daylight I sent my horse pistols and holsters as a present to the king, and being very desirous to get away from a place which was likely soon to become the seat of war, I begged the messenger to inform the king that I wished to depart from Camus as soon as he should find it convenient to appoint me a guide. In about an hour the king sent his messenger to thank me for the present, and eight horsemen to conduct me to Jara. They told me that the king wished me to proceed to Jara with all possible expedition, that they might return before anything decisive should happen between the armies of Bambara need Karta. We accordingly departed forthwith from Kemu, accompanied by three of Daisy's sons and about two hundred horsemen, who kindly undertook to see me a little way on my journey. Volume 1, Chapter 8 Adventures Between Kamu and Jara On the evening of the day of our departure from Kamu, the king's eldest son and great part of the horsemen have returned, we reached a village called Marina, where we slept. During the night some thieves broke into the hut where I had deposited my baggage, and having cut open one of my bundles, stole a quantity of beads, part of my clothes, and some amber and gold, which happened to be in one of the pockets. I complained to my protectors, but without effect. The next day, February 14th, was far advanced before we departed from Marina, and we travelled slowly, on account of the excessive heat, until four o'clock in the afternoon, when two negroes were observed sitting among some thorny bushes at a little distance from the road. The king's people, taking it for granted that they were runaway slaves, cocked their muskets and rode at full speed in different directions through the bushes in order to surround them and prevent their escaping. The negroes, however, waited with great composure until we came within bow-shot of them, when each of them took from his quiver a handful of arrows, and putting two between his teeth and one in his bow, waved to us with his hand to keep at a distance, upon which one of the king's people called out to the strangers to give some account of themselves. They said that they were natives of Torda, a neighboring village, and had come to the place to gather tumbarongs. These are small farinaceous berries, of a yellow color and delicious taste, which I knew to be the fruit of the ramus lotus of Linnaeus. The lotus is very common in all the kingdoms which I visited but is found in the greatest plenty on the sandy soil of Carta, Ludamar, and the northern parts of Bambara, where it is one of the most common shrubs of the country. I had observed the same species at Gambia. As this shrub is found in Tunis, and also in the Negro kingdoms, and it furnishes the natives of the latter with a food resembling bread, and also with a sweet liqueur which is much relished by them, there can be little doubt of its being the lotus mentioned by Pliny as the food of Libyan lotophagi. An army may very well have been fed with the bread I have tasted, made of the meal of the fruit, as is said by Pliny to have been done in Libya, and as the taste of the bread is sweet and agreeable, it is not likely that the soldiers would complain of it. 
we arrived in the evening at the village of torda when all the rest of the king's people turned back except two who remained with me as guides to jara february fifteenth i departed from torda and about two o'clock came to a considerable town called funningkeddy as we approached the town the inhabitants were much alarmed for as one of my guides wore a turban they mistook us for some moorish banditti this misapprehension was soon cleared up and we were well received by a gambian slatti who resides at this town and at whose house we lodged february sixteenth we were informed that a number of people would go from this town to jara on the day following and as the road was much infested by the moors we resolved to stay and accompany the travellers about two o'clock as i was lying asleep upon a bullock's hide behind the door of the hut i was awakened by the screams of women and a general clamour and confusion among the inhabitants at first i suspected that the bambarans had actually entered the town but observing my boy upon the top of one of the huts i called to him to know what was the matter he informed me that the moors were coming a second time to steal the cattle and that they were now close to the town i mounted the roof of the hut and observed a large herd of bullocks coming towards the town followed by five moors on horseback who drove the cattle forward with their muskets when they had reached the wells which are close to town the moors selected from the herd sixteen of the finest beasts and drove them off at a full cell gallop during this transaction the townspeople to the number of five hundred stood collected close to the walls of the town and when the moors drove the cattle away though they passed within pistol shot of them the inhabitants scarcely made a show of resistance i only saw four muskets fired which being loaded with gunpowder of the negro's own manufacture did no execution shortly after this i observed a number of people supporting a young man on horseback and conducting him slowly towards the town this was one of the herdsmen who attempting to throw his spear had been wounded by a shot from one of the moors his mother walked on before quite frantic with grief clapping her hands and enumerating the good qualities of her son e mafo fenio he never told a lie said the disconsolate mother as her wounded son was carried in at the gate e mafo fonio abda he never told a lie no never when they had conveyed him to his hut and laid him upon a mat all the spectators joined in lamenting his fate by screaming and howling in the most piteous manner after their grief had subsided a little i was desired to examine the wound i found that the ball had passed quite through his leg having fractured both bones a little below the knee the poor boy was faint from the loss of blood and his situation withal so very precarious that i could not console his relations with any great hopes of his recovery however to give him a possible chance i observed to them that it was necessary to cut off his leg above the knee this proposal made every one start with horror they had never heard of such a method of cure and would by no means give their consent to it indeed they evidently considered me sort of a cannibal for proposing so cruel and unheard of an operation which in their opinion would be attended with more pain and danger than the wound itself the patient was therefore committed to the care of some old bashreens who endeavoured to secure him a passage into paradise 
by whispering in his ear some arabic sentences and desiring him to repeat them after many unsuccessful attempts the poor heathen at last pronounced la ilya de allah mohammed razao aliyah there is but one god and mohammed is his prophet and the disciples of the prophet assured his mother that her son had given sufficient evidence of his faith and would be happy in a future state he died the same evening february seventeenth my guides informed me that in order to avoid the moorish banditti it was necessary to travel in the night we accordingly departed from funinketty in the afternoon accompanied by about thirty people carrying their effects with them into ludamar for fear of the war we traveled with great silence and expedition until midnight when we stopped in a sort of enclosure near a small village but the thermometer being so low as sixty-eight degrees none of the negroes could sleep on account of the cold at daybreak on the eighteenth we resumed our journey and at eight o'clock passed simbing the frontier village of ludamar situated on a narrow pass between two rocky hills and surrounded with a high wall from this village major houghton being deserted by his negro servants who refused to follow him into the moorish country wrote his last letter with a pencil to dr laidley this brave but unfortunate man heaving surmounted many difficulties had taken a northerly direction had endeavored to pass through the kingdom of ludamar where i afterwards learned the following particulars concerning his melancholy fate on his arrival at jara he got acquainted with certain moorish merchants who were travelling to tishit a place near the salt pits in the great desert ten days journey to the northward to purchase salt and the major at the expense of a musket and some tobacco engaged them to convey him thither it is impossible to form any other opinion on this determination than that the moors intentionally deceived him either with regard to the route that he wished to pursue or the state of the intermediate country between jara and timbuktu their intention probably was to rob and leave him in the desert at the end of two days he suspected their treachery and insisted on returning to jara finding him persist in this determination the moors robbed him of everything he possessed and went off with their camels the poor major being thus deserted returned on foot to a watering place in possession of the moors called terra he had been some days without food and the unfeeling moors refusing to give him any he sank at last under his distresses whether he actually perished of hunger or was murdered outright by the savage mohammedans is not certainly known his body was dragged into the woods and i was shown at a distance the spot where his remains were left to perish about four miles to the north of simbing we came to a small stream of water where we observed a number of wild horses they were all of one color and galloped away from us at an easy rate frequently stopping and looking back the negroes hunt them for food and their flesh is much esteemed about noon we arrived at jara a large town situated at the bottom of some rocky hills volume one chapter nine the town of jara detained by the moors the town of jara is of considerable extent the houses are built of clay and stone intermixed the clay answering the purpose of mortar it is situated in the moorish kingdom of ludamar but the major part of the inhabitants are negroes from the borders of the southern states 
who prefer a precarious protection under the moors which they purchase by a tribute rather than continue exposed to their predatory hostilities the tribute they pay is considerable and they manifest towards their more superiors the most unlimited obedience and submission and are treated by them with the utmost indignity and contempt the moors of this and the other states adjoining the country of the negroes resemble in the persons the mulattoes of the west indies to so great a degree as not easily to be distinguished from them and in truth the present generation seem to be a mixed race between the moors properly so called of the north and the negroes of the south possessing many of the worst qualities of both nations of the origin of these moorish tribes as distinguished from the inhabitants of barbary from whom they are divided by the great desert nothing further seems to be known than what is related by john leo the african whose account may be abridged as follows before the arabian conquest about the middle of the seventh century all the inhabitants of africa whether they were descended from numidians phoenicians carthaginians romans vandals or goths were comprehended under the general name of maori or moors all these nations were converted to the religion of mohammed during the arabian empire under the caliphs after this time many of the numidian tribes who led a wandering life in the desert and supported themselves upon the produce of their cattle retired southward across the great desert to avoid the fury of the arabians and by one of those tribes says leo that of zanghanga were discovered and conquered the negro nations on the niger by the niger is here undoubtedly meant the river of senegal which in the mandingo language is bathing or the black river to what extent these peoples are now spread over the african continent is difficult to ascertain there is reason to believe that their dominion stretches from west to east in a narrow line or belt from the mouth of the senegal on the northern side of that river to the confines of abyssinia they are subtle and treacherous race of people and take every opportunity of cheating and plundering the credulous and unsuspecting negroes but their manners and general habits of life will be best explained as incidents occur in the course of my narrative the difficulties we already encountered the unsettled state of the country and above all the savage and overbearing deportment of the moors had so completely frightened my attendants that they declared they would rather relinquish every claim to reward than proceed one step farther to the eastward indeed the danger they incurred of being seized by the moors and sold into slavery became every day more apparent and i could not condemn their apprehensions in this situation deserted by my attendants and reflecting that my retreat was cut off by the war behind me and that a moorish country of ten days journey lay before me i applied to damien to obtain permission from ali the chief or sovereign of ludamar that i might pass through his country unmolested into bambara and i hired one of damon's slaves to accompany me thither as soon as such permission should be obtained a messenger was dispatched to ali who at this time was encamped near benowen and as a present was necessary in order to ensure success 
I sent him five garments of cotton cloth, which I purchased of Damon for one of my fowling pieces. Fourteen days elapsed in settling this affair, but on the evening of the 26th of February, one of Ali's slaves arrived with directions, as he pretended, to conduct me in safety as far as Goomba, and told me I was to pay him one garment of blue cotton cloth for his attendance. My faithful boy, observing that I was about to proceed without him, resolved to accompany me, and told me that though he wished me to turn back, he never entertained any serious thoughts of deserting me, but had been advised to it by Johnson, with a view to induce me to turn immediately for Gambia. February 27th. I delivered most of my papers to Johnson, to convey them to Gambia as soon as possible, reserving a duplicate for myself in case of accidents. I likewise left in Damon's possessions a bundle of clothes, and other things that were not absolutely necessary, for I wished to diminish my baggage as much as possible, that the Moors might have fewer inducements to plunder us. Things thus being adjusted, we departed from Jara in the forenoon, and slept at Trumgumba, a small walled village inhabited by a mixture of Negroes and Moors, on the day following, February 28th, we reached Kira, and on the 29th, after a toilsome journey over a sandy country, we came to Comp, a watering place belonging to the Moors, from whence, on the morning following, we proceeded to Dina, a large town, and like Jara, built of stone and clay. The Moors are here in greater proportion to the Negroes than at Jara. They assembled round the hut of the Negro where I lodged, and treated me with the greatest insolence. They hissed, shouted, and abused me. They even spat in my face, with a view to irritate me, and afford them a pretext for seizing my baggage. But finding such insults had not the desired effect, they had recourse to the final and decisive argument that I was a Christian, and of course that my property was lawful plunder to the followers of Mohammed. They accordingly opened my bundles and robbed me of everything they fancied. My attendants, finding that everybody could rob me with impunity, insisted on returning to Jara. The day following, March 2nd, I endeavored, by all the means in my power, to prevail upon my people to go on, but they still continued obstinate, and having reason to fear some further insult from the fanatic Moors, I resolved to proceed alone. Accordingly, the next morning, about two o'clock, I departed from Dina. It was moonlight, but the roaring of the wild beasts made it necessary to proceed with caution. When I had reached a piece of rising ground about half a mile from the town, I heard somebody halloo, and looking back, saw my faithful boy running after me. He informed me that Ali's men had gone back to Benoan and that Damon's negro was about to depart for Jara, but he said he had no doubt, if I would stop a little, that he could persuade the latter to accompany us. I waited accordingly, and in about an hour the boy returned with the negro, and we continued traveling over a sandy country, covered chiefly with the Ascaplinus gigantea until midday, when we came to a number of deserted huts, and seeing some appearances of water at a little distance, I sent the boy to fill a sofru, but as he was examining the place for water, the roaring of a lion that was probably on the same pursuit 
induced the frightened boy to return in haste, and we submitted patiently to the disappointment. In the afternoon, we reached a town inhabited chiefly by Fulas, called Samaning Kus. Next morning, March 4th, we set out for Samka, which place we reached about two o'clock. On the road we observed immense quantities of locusts. The trees were quite black with them. Samka is a large town, and when the Moors and Bambarans were at war, was thrice attacked by the former, but they were driven off with great loss, though the king of Bambara was afterwards obliged to give up this and all the other towns as far as Gumba, in order to obtain peace. Here I lodged at the house of a negro who practiced the art of making gunpowder. He showed me a bag of nitra, very white, but the crystals were much smaller than common. They procure it in considerable quantities from the ponds, which are filled in the rainy season, and to which the cattle resort for coolness during the heat of the day. When the water is evaporated, a white affluence is observed on the mud, which the natives collect and purify in such a manner as to answer their purpose. The Moors supply them with sulphur from the Mediterranean, and the process is completed by pounding the different articles together in a wooden mortar. The grains are very unequal, and the sound of its explosion is by no means so sharp as that produced by European gunpowder. March 5th. We departed from Samka at daylight. About noon we stopped a little at a village called Dangali, and in the evening arrived at Dali. We saw upon the road two large herds of camels feeding. When the Moors turn their camels to feed, they tie up one of their forelegs to prevent their straying. This happened to be a feast day at Dali, and the people were dancing before the duty's house. But when they were informed that a white man was come into the town, they left off dancing and came to the place where I lodged, walking in regular order, two and two with the music before them. They play upon a sort of flute, but instead of blowing into a hole on the side, they blow obliquely over the end, which is half shut by a thin piece of wood. They govern the holes on the side with their fingers, and play some simple and very plaintive airs. They continue to dance and sing until midnight, during which time I was surrounded by so great a crowd as made it necessary for me to satisfy their curiosity by sitting still. March 6th. We stop here this morning because some of the townspeople who were going for Goomba on the day following wished to accompany us, but in order to avoid the crowd of people which usually assembled in the evening, we went to a negro's village to the east of Dali, called Sami, where we were kindly received by the hospitable duty, who on this occasion killed two fine sheep and invited his friends to come and feast with him. March 7th. Our landlord was so proud of the honor of entertaining a white man that he insisted on my staying with him and his friends until the cool of the evening, when he said he would conduct me to the next village. As I was now within two days' journey of Goomba, I had no apprehension from the Moors, and readily accepted the invitation. I spent the forenoon very pleasantly with these poor Negroes. Their company was the more acceptable as the gentleness of their manners presented a striking contrast to the rudeness and barbarity of the Moors. They enlivened their conversation by drinking a fermented liquor made from corn, the same sort of beer that I have described in a former chapter, 
and better I never tasted in Great Britain. In the midst of this harmless festivity, I flattered myself that all danger from the moors was over. Fancy had already placed me on the banks of the Niger, and presented to my imagination a thousand delightful scenes in my future progress, when a party of moors unexpectedly entered the hut and dispelled the golden dream. They came, they said, by Ali's orders, to convey me to his camp at Benome. If I went peacefully, they told me, I had nothing to fear, but if I refused, they had orders to bring me by force. I was struck dumb by surprise and terror, which the Moors observed endeavored to calm my apprehensions by repeating the assurance that I had nothing to fear. Their visit, they added, was occasioned by the curiosity of Ali's wife Fatima, who had heard so much about Christians that she was very anxious to see one. As soon as her curiosity should be satisfied, they had no doubt, they said, that Ali would give me a handsome present and send a person to conduct me to Bambara. Finding entreaty and resistance equally fruitless, I prepared to follow the messengers and took leave of my landlord and his company with great reluctance. Accompanied by my faithful boy, for Damon's slave made his escape on seeing the moors, we reached Dali in the evening, where we were strictly watched by the moors during the night. March 8th. We were conducted by a circuitous path through the woods to Dangali, where we slept. March 9th. We continued our journey and in the afternoon arrived at Samka. Next morning, March 10th, we set out for Saminkan Kus. On the road we overtook a woman and two boys with an ass. She informed us that she was going for Bambara, but had been stopped on the road by a party of Moors who had taken most of her clothes and some gold from her, and that she would be under the necessity of returning to Dina till the fast moon was over. The same even the new moon was seen which ushered in the month of ramadan large fires were made in different parts of the town and a greater quantity of victuals than usual dressed upon the occasion march eleventh by daylight the moors were in readiness but as i had suffered much from thirst on the road i made my boy fill a so frew of water for my own use, for the Moors assured me that they should not taste either meat or drink until sunset. However, I found that the excessive heat of the sun and the dust we raised in traveling overcame their scruples and made my soft rue a very useful part of our baggage. On our arrival at Dina, I went to pay my respects to one of Ali's sons. I found him sitting in a low hut with five or six more of his companions, washing their hands and feet, and frequently taking water into their mouths, garling and spitting it out again. I was no sooner seated than he handed me a double-barreled gun and told me to dye the stock of a blue color and repair one of the locks. I found great difficulty in persuading him that I knew nothing about the matter. However, says he, if you cannot repair the gun, you shall give me some knives and scissors immediately. And when my boy, who acted as interpreter, assured him that I had no such articles, he hastily snatched up a musket that stood by him, cocked it, and put the muzzle close to the boy's ear would certainly have shot him dead upon the spot had not the moors wrestled the musket from him and made signs for us to retreat march twelfth 
we departed from Dina towards Benawan, and about nine o'clock came to a quarry, whence the moors were preparing to depart to the southward, on account of the scarcity of water. Here we filled our sofru, and continued our journey over a hot sandy country, covered with small stunted shrubs, until about one o'clock when the heat of the sun obliged us to stop. But our water being expanded, we could not prudently remain longer than a few minutes to collect a little gum, which is an excellent succulum for water, as it keeps the mouth moist and allays for a time the pain in the throat. About five o'clock we came in sight of Bedawum, the residence of Ali. It presented to the eye a great number of dirty-looking tents, scattered without order over a large space of ground, and among the tents appeared large herds of camels, cattle, and goats. We reached the skirts of this camp a little before sunset, and, with much entreaty, procured a little water. My arrival was no sooner observed than the people who drew water at the wells threw down their buckets. Those in the tents mounted their horses, and men, women, and children came running or galloping towards me. I soon found myself surrounded by such a crowd that I could scarcely move. One pulled my clothes, another took off my hat. A third stopped me to examine my waistcoat buttons, and a fourth called out, La Ila El Allah, Mohammed Razal Ali. There is but one God, and Mohammed is his prophet, and signified in a threatening manner that I must repeat those words. We reached at length the king's tent where we found a great number of people, men and women, assembled. Ali was sitting upon a black leather cushion, clipping a few hairs from his upper lip, a female attendant holding up a looking-glass before him. He appeared to be an old man of the Arab caste, with a long white beard, and he had a sullen and indignant aspect. He surveyed me with attention, and inquired of the Moors if I could speak Arabic. Being answered in the negative, he appeared much surprised, and continued silent. The surrounding attendants, and especially the ladies, were abundantly more inquisitive. They asked a thousand questions, inspected every part of my apparel, searched my pockets and obliged me to unbutton my waistcoat and display the whiteness of my skin. They even counted my toes and fingers, as if they doubted whether I was in truth a human being. In a little time the priests announced evening prayers, but before the people departed, the Moor who had acted as interpreter informed me that Ali was about to present me with something to eat and looked around, I observed some boys bringing a wild hog, which they tied to one of the tent strings, and Ali made signs to me to kill and dress it for supper. Though I was very hungry, I did not think it prudent to eat any part of an animal so much detested by the Moors, and therefore told him that I never ate such food. Then they then untied the hog, in hopes that it would run immediately at me, for they believed that a great enmity subsists between hogs and Christians. But in this they were disappointed, for the animal no sooner regained his liberty than he began to attack indiscriminately every person that came in his way, and at last took shelter under the couch upon which the king was sitting. The assembly being thus dissolved, I was conducted to the tent of Ali's chief slave. 
but was not permitted to enter nor allowed to touch anything belonging to it i requested something to eat and a little boiled corn with salt and water was at length sent me in a wooden bowl and a mat was spread upon the sand before the tent on which i passed the night surrounded by the curious multitude at sunrise ali with a few attendants came on horseback to visit me and signified that he had provided a hut for me where i would be sheltered from the sun i was accordingly conducted thither and found the hut comparatively cool and pleasant i was no sooner seated in this my new habitation than the moors assembled in crowds to behold me but i found it rather a troublesome levy for i was obliged to take off one of my stockings and show them my foot and even to take off my jacket and waistcoat to show them how my clothes were put on and off they were much delighted with the curious contrivance of buttons all this was to be repeated to every succeeding visitor for such as they already seen these wonders insisted on their friends seeing the same and in this manner i was employed dressing and undressing buttoning and unbuttoning from noon till night about eight o'clock ali sent me supper for some couscous and salt and water which was very acceptable being the only victuals i had tasted since morning i observed that in the night the moors kept regular watch and frequently looked into the hut to see if i was asleep and if it was quite dark they would light a wisp of grass about two o'clock in the morning a moor entered the hut probably with a view to steal something or perhaps to murder me and groping about he laid his hand upon my shoulder as night visitors were at best but suspicious characters i sprang up the moment he laid his hand upon me and the moor in his haste to get off stumbled over my boy and fell with his face upon the wild hog which returned the attack by biting the moor's arm the screams of this man alarmed the people in the king's tent who immediately conjectured that i had made my escape and a number of them mounted their horses and prepared to pursue me i observed upon this occasion that ali did not sleep in his own tent but came galloping upon a white horse from a small tent at a considerable distance indeed the tyrannical and cruel behavior of this man made him so jealous of every person around him that even his own slaves and domestics knew not where he slept when the moors had explained to him that the cause of this outcry they all went away and i was permitted to sleep quietly until morning march thirteenth with the returning day commenced the same round of insult and irritation the boys assembled to beat the hog and the men and women to plague the christian it is impossible for me to describe the behavior of a people who study mischief as a science and exult in the miseries and misfortunes of their fellow creatures volume one chapter ten a moorish wedding the moors though very indolent themselves are rigid taskmasters and keep every person under them in full employment my boy demba was sent to the woods to collect withered grass for ali's horses and after a variety of projects concerning myself they at last found out an employment for me this was no other than the respectable office of barber 
i was to make my first exhibition in this capacity in the royal presence and to be honored with the task of shaving the head of the young prince of ludamar i accordingly seated myself upon the sand and the boy with some hesitation sat down beside me a small razor about three inches long was put into my hand and i was ordered to proceed but whether from my own want of skill or the improper shape of the instrument i unfortunately made a slight incision in the boy's head at the very commencement of the operation and the king observing the awkward manner in which i held the razor concluded that his son's head was in very improper hands and ordered me to resign the razor and walk out of the tent this i considered as a very fortunate circumstance for i had laid it down as a rule to make myself as useless and insignificant as possible as the only means of recovering my liberty march eighteenth four moors arrived from jara with johnson my interpreter having seized him before he had received any intimation of my confinement and bringing with them a bundle of clothes that i had left at daman jumba's house for my use in case i should return by the way of jara johnson was led into ali's tent and examined the bundle was opened and i was sent for to explain the use of the different articles i was happy however to find that johnson had committed my papers to the charge of one of damon's wives when i had satisfied ali's curiosity respecting the different articles of apparel the bundle was again tied up and put into a large cowskin bag that stood in a corner of the tent the same evening ali sent three of his people to inform me that there were many thieves in the neighborhood and that to prevent the rest of my things from being stolen it was necessary to convey them all into his tent my clothes instruments and everything that belonged to me were accordingly carried away and though the heat and dust made clean linen very necessary and refreshing i could not procure a single shirt out of the small stock i had brought along with me ali was however disappointed by not finding among my effects the quantity of gold and amber that he expected but to make sure of everything he sent the same people on the morning following to examine whether i had anything concealed about my person they with their usual rudeness searched every part of my apparel and stripped me of all my gold amber my watch and one of my pocket compasses i had fortunately in the night buried the other compass in the sand and this with the clothes i had on was all that the tyranny of ali had now left me the gold and amber were highly gratifying to moorish advice but the pocket compass soon became an object of superstitious curiosity ali was very desirous to be informed why that small piece of iron the needle always pointed to the great desert and i found myself somewhat puzzled to answer the question to have pleaded my ignorance would have created a suspicion that i wished to conceal the real truth from i therefore told him that my mother resided far beyond the sands of the sahara and that whilst she was alive the piece of iron would always point that way and serve as a guide to conduct me to her and that if she was dead it would point to her grave ali now looked at the compass with redoubled amazement turned it round and round repeatedly but observing that it always pointed the same way he took it up with great caution and returned it to me manifesting that he thought there was something of magic in it and that he was afraid of keeping so dangerous 
an instrument in his possession march twentieth this morning a council of chief men was held in ally's tent respecting me their decisions though they were all unfavorable to me were differently related by different persons some said they intended to put me to death others that i was only to lose my right hand but the most probable account was that which i received from ally's own son a boy about nine years of age who came to me in the evening and with much concern informed me that his uncle had persuaded his father to put out my eyes which they said resembled those of a cat and that all the bushreens had approved of his measure his father however he said would not put the sentence into execution until fatima the queen who was at present in the north had seen me march twenty first anxious to know my destiny i went to the king early in the morning and as a number of bushreens were assembled i thought this a favorable opportunity of discovering their intentions i therefore began by begging his permission to return to jara which was flatly refused his wife he said had not yet seen me and i must stay until she came to benoam after which i should be at liberty to depart and that my horse which had been taken away from me the day that after i arrived should be again restored to me unsatisfactory as this answer was i was forced to appear pleased and as there was little hope of making my escape at this season of the year on account of the excessive heat and the total want of water in the woods i resolved to wait patiently until the rains had set in or until some more favorable opportunity should present itself but hope deferred maketh this heart sick this tedious procrastination from day to day and the thoughts of traveling through the negro kingdoms in the rainy season which was now fast approaching made me very melancholy and having passed a restless night i found myself attacked in the morning by a smart fever i had wrapped myself close up in my cloak with a view to induce perspiration and was asleep when a party of moors entered the hut and with their usual rudeness pulled the cloak from me i made signs to them that i was sick and wished much to sleep but i solicited in vain my distress was matter of sport to them and they endeavored to heighten it by every means in their power in this perplexity i left my hut and walked to some shady trees at a little distance from the camp where i lay down but even here persecution followed me and solitude was thought too great an indulgence for a distressed christian ali's son with a number of horsemen came galloping to the place and ordered me to rise and follow them i begged they would allow me to remain where i was if it were only for a few hours but they paid little attention to what i said and after a few threatening words one of them pulled out a pistol from a leather bag that was fastened to the pommel of his saddle and presenting it towards me snapped it twice he did this with so much indifference that i really doubted whether the pistol was loaded he cocked it a third time and was striking the flint with a piece of steel when i begged them to desist and returned with them to the camp when we entered ali's tent we found him much out of humor he called for the moor's pistol and amused himself for some time with opening and shutting the pan at length taking up his powder horn he fresh primed it and turning round to me with a menacing look said 
something in arabic which i did not understand i desired my boy who was sitting before the tent to inquire what offence i had committed when i was informed that having gone out of the camp without ali's permission they suspected that i had some design of making my escape and that in future if i was seen without the skirts of the camp orders had been given that i should be shot by the first person that observed me in the afternoon the horizon to the eastward was thick and hazy and the moors procrastinated a sand wind which accordingly commenced on the morning following and lasted with slight intermission for two days the force of the wind was not in itself very great it was what a seaman would have denominated a stiff breeze but the quantity of sand and dust carried before it was such as to darken the whole atmosphere about this time all the women of the camp had their feet and the ends of their fingers stained of a dark saffron color i could never ascertain whether this was done from the motives of religion or by way of ornament march twenty eighth this morning a large herd of cattle arrived from the eastward and one of the drivers to whom ali had lent my horse came into my hut with the leg of an antelope as a present and told me that my horse was standing before ali's tent in a little time ali sent one of his slaves to inform me that in the afternoon i must be in readiness to ride out with him as he intended to show me to some of his women about four o'clock ali with six of his courtiers came riding to my hut and told me to follow them i readily complied but here a new difficulty occurred the moors accustomed to a loose and easy dress could not reconcile themselves to the appearance of my nankin breeches which they said were not only inelegant but on account of their tightness very indecent and as this was a visit to ladies ali ordered my boy to bring out the loose cloak which i had always worn since my arrival at benome and told me to wrap it close round me we visited the tents of four different ladies at every one of which i was presented with a bowl of milk and water all these ladies were remarkably corpulent which is considered here as the highest mark of beauty they were very inquisitive and examined my hair and skin with great attention but affected to consider me as a sort of inferior being to themselves and would knit their brows and seem to shudder when they looked at the whiteness of my skin the moors are certainly very good horsemen they ride without fear their saddles being high before and behind afford them a very secure seat and if they chance to fall the whole country is so soft and sandy that they are very seldom hurt their greatest pride and one of their principal amusements is to put the horse to its full speed and then stop him with a sudden jerk so as frequently to bring him down upon his haunches ali always rode upon a milk-white horse with its tail dyed red he never walked unless when he went to say his prayers and even in the night two or three horses were always kept ready saddled at a little distance from his own hut the moor set a very high value upon their horses for it is by their superior fleetness that they are enabled to make so many predatory excursions into the negro countries they feed them three or four times a day and generally give them a large quantity of sweet milk in the evening which the horses appear to relish very much 
April 3rd. This forenoon, a child, which had been some time sickly, died in the next tent, and the mother and relations immediately began the death howl. They were joined by a number of female visitors, who came on purpose to assist at the melancholy concert. I had no opportunity of seeing the burial, which is generally performed secretly, in the dusk of the evening, and frequently at only a few yards' distance from the tent. Over the grave they plant one particular shrub, and no stranger is allowed to pluck a leaf, or even to touch it, so great a veneration have they for the dead. April 7th about four o'clock in the afternoon a whirlwind passed through the camp with such violence that it overturned three tents and blew down one side of my hut these whirlwinds come from the great desert and at this season of the year are so common that i have seen five or six of them at one time they carry up quantities of sand to an amazing height which resemble at a distance so many moving pillars of smoke the scorching heat of the sun upon a dry and sandy country makes the air insufferably hot ali having robbed me of my thermometer i had no means of forming a comparative judgment but in the middle of the day when the beams of the vertical sun are seconded by the scorching wind from the desert the ground is frequently heated to such a degree as not to be borne by the naked foot. Even the negro slaves will not run from one tent to another without their sandals. At this time of the day the moors lie stretched at length in their tents, either asleep or unwilling to move, and I have often felt the wind so hot that I could not hold my hand in the current of air which came through the crevices of my hut without feeling sensible pain. April 8th. This day the wind blew from the southwest, and in the night there was a heavy shower of rain, accompanied with thunder and lightning. April 10th. In the evening the tabala, or large drum, was beat to announce a wedding which was held at one of the neighboring tents a great number of people of both sexes assembled but without that mirth and hilarity which takes place at a negro wedding here was neither singing nor dancing nor any other amusement that i could perceive a woman was beating the drum, and the other women joining at times like a chorus, by setting up sh a shrill scream, and at the same time moving their tongues from one side of the mouth to the other with great clarity. I was soon tired, and had returned into my hut, when I was sitting almost asleep, when an old woman entered with a wooden bowl in her hand, and signified that she had brought me a present from the bride. Before I could recover from the surprise which this message created, the woman discharged the contents of the bowl full in my face. Finding that it was the same sort of holy water with which, among the Hottentots, a priest is said to sprinkle a newly married couple, I began to suspect that the old lady was actuated by mischiefs or malice, but she gave me seriously to understand that it was a nuptial benediction from the bride's own person, and which, on such occasions, is always received by the young unmarried moors as a mark of distinguished favor. This being the case, I wiped my face and sent my acknowledgments to the lady, the wedding drum continued to beat, and the women to sing, or rather whistle, all night. About nine in the morning the bride was brought in state from her mother's tent, attended by a number of women who carried her tent, a present from the husband, some bearing up the poles, others holding by the strings, 
and in this manner they marched whistling as formerly until they came to the place appointed for her residence where they pitched the tent the husband followed with a number of men leading four bullocks which they tied to the tent strings and having killed another and distributed the beef among the people the ceremony was concluded volume one chapter eleven sufferings in captivity one whole month had now elapsed since i was led into captivity during which time each returning day brought me fresh distresses i watched the lingering course of the sun with anxiety and blessed his evening beams as they shined a yellow lustre along the sandy floor of my hut for it was then that my oppressors left me and allowed me to pass the sultry night in solitude and reflection about midnight a bowl of couscous with some salt and water were brought for me and my two attendants this was our common fare and it was all that was allowed us to allay the cravings of hunger and support nature for the whole of the following day for it is to be observed that this was the mohammedan lent and as the moors kept the fast with a religious strictness they thought it proper to compel me though a christian to similar observance time however somewhat reconciled me to my situation i found that i could bear hunger and thirst better than i expected and at length i endeavored to beguile the tedious hours by learning to write arabic april fourteenth as queen fatima had not yet arrived ali proposed to go to the north and bring her back with him but as the place was two days journey from benome it was necessary to have some refreshment on the road and ali suspicious of those about him was so afraid of being poisoned that he never ate anything but what was dressed under his own immediate inspection a fine bullock was therefore killed and the flesh being cut up into thin slices was dried in the sun and this with two bags of dried couscous formed his travelling provisions previous to his departure the black people of the town of benwan came according to their annual custom to show their arms and bring their stipulated tribute of corn and cloth they were but badly armed twenty-two with muskets forty or fifty with bows and arrows and nearly the same number of men and boys with spears only they arranged themselves before the tent where they waited until their arms were examined and some little disputes settled about midnight on the sixteenth ali departed quietly from benone accompanied by a few attendants he was expected to return in the course of nine or ten days april eighteenth two days after the departure of ali a sharif arrived with salt and some other articles from wallet the capital of the kingdom of beru as there was no tent appropriated for him he took up his abode in the same hut with me he seemed to be a well-informed man and his acquaintance both with the arabic and bambara tongues enabled him to travel with ease and safety through a number of kingdoms for though his place of residence was wallet he had visited Husa and had lived some years at timbuktu upon my inquiring so particularly about the distance from wallet to timbuktu he asked me if i intended to travel that way and being answered in the affirmative he shook his head and said it would not do for that christians were looked upon there as the devil's children and enemies to the prophet from him i learned the following particulars that hausa was the largest town he had ever seen that wallet was larger than timbuktu but being remote from the niger 
and its trading consistently chiefly of salt, it was not so much resorted to by strangers that between Benome and Wallet was ten days' journey, but the road did not lead through any remarkable towns, and travelers supported themselves by purchasing milk from the Arabs, who keep their herds by the watering places. Two of the day's journeys was over a sandy country without water. From Wallet to Timbuktu was eleven days more, but water was more plentiful, and the journey was usually performed upon bullocks. He said there were many Jews at Timbuktu, but they all spoke Arabic and used the same prayers as the Moors. He frequently pointed his hand to the southeast quarter, or rather the east by south, observing that Timbuktu was situated in that direction. And though I made him repeat this information again and again, I never found him to vary more than half a point, which was to the southward. April 24th This morning Sharif Sidi Mohammed Mora Abdallah, a native of Morocco, arrived with five bullocks loaded with salt. He had formerly resided some months at Gibraltar, where he had picked up as much English as enabled him to make himself understood. He informed me that he had been five months in coming from Santa Cruz, but that great part of the time he had spent in trading. When I requested him to enumerate the days employed in traveling from Morocco to Benome, he gave them as follows. To Swara, three days. To Agadir, three days. To Jinikin, ten. To Wadenom, four. To Lakenig, five. To Ziriwin, Zirimani, five. To Teshit, ten. To Benon, ten. In all, fifty days. But travelers usually rest a long while at Jinikin and Teshit, at the latter of which places they dig the rock salt, which is so great an article of commerce with the Negroes. In conversing with the Sharifs and the different strangers that resorted to the camp, I passed my time with rather less uneasiness than formerly. On the other hand, as the dressing of my victuals was now left entirely to the care of Ali's slaves, over whom I had not the smallest control, I found myself but ill-supplied, worse even than in the fast month. For two successive nights they neglected to send us our accustomed meal, and though my boy went to a small negro town near camp, and begged with great diligence from hut to hut, he could only procure a few handfuls of ground nuts, which he readily shared with me. We have been for some days in daily expectation of Ali's return from Sahil, or the North Country, with his wife Fatima. In the meanwhile, Mansong, king of Bambara, as I have related in chapter 8, had sent to Ali for a party of horse to assist in storming Geoginguma. With this demand, Ali had not only refused to comply, but had treated the messengers with great haughtiness and contempt, upon which Masson gave up all thoughts of taking the town, and prepared to chastise Ali for his contumacy. Things were in this situation when, on the 29th of April, a messenger arrived at Benome with the disagreeable intelligence that the Bambara army was approaching the frontiers of Ludamar. This threw the whole country into confusion, and in the afternoon Ali's son, with about twenty horsemen, arrived at Benome. He ordered all the cattle to be driven away immediately, all the tents to be struck, and the people to hold themselves in readiness to depart at daylight the next morning. April 30th. At daybreak the whole camp was in motion. 
the baggage was carried upon bullocks the two tent poles being placed one on each side and the different wooden articles of the tent distributed in like manner the tent cloth was thrown over all and upon this was commonly placed one or two women for the moorish women are very bad walkers the king's favorite concubines rode upon camels with a saddle of a particular construction and a canopy to shelter them from the sun we proceeded to the northward until noon when the king's son ordered the whole company except the tents to enter a thick low wood which was upon our right i was sent along with the two tents and arrived in the evening at a negro town called farani here we pitched the tents in an open place at no great distance from the town may first as i had some reason to suspect that this day was also to be considered as a fast i went in the morning to the negro town of farani and begged some provisions from the duty who readily supplied my wants and desired me to come to his house every day during my stay in the neighborhood these hospitable people are looked upon by the moors and as an abject race of slaves and are treated accordingly may third we departed from the vicinity of farandi and after a circuitous route through the woods arrived at ali's camp in the afternoon this encampment was larger than that of benome and was situated in the middle of a thick wood about two miles distant from a negro town called boo baker i immediately waited upon ali in order to pay my respects to queen fatima who had come with him from sahil he seemed much pleased with my coming shook hands with me and informed his wife that i was the christian she was a woman of the arab caste with long black hair and remarkable corpulent she appeared at first rather shocked at the thought of having a christian so near her but when i had by means of a negro boy who spoke the mandingo and arabic tongues answered a great many questions which her curiosity suggested respected the country of the christians she seemed more at ease and presented me with a bowl of milk which i considered as a very favorable omen the heat was now almost insufferable all nature seemed sinking under it the distant country presented to the eye a dreary expanse of sand with a few stunted trees and prickly bushes in the shade of which the hungry cattle licked up the withered grass while the camels and goats picked off the scanty foliage the scarcity of water was greater here than at benome day and night the wells were crowded with cattle lowing and fighting with each other to come at the troughs excessive thirst made many of them furious others being too weak to contend for the water endeavored to quench their thirst by devouring the black mud from the gutters near the wells where they did with great avidity though it was commonly fatal to them one night having solicited in vain for water at the camp and being quite feverish i resolved to try my fortune at the wells which were about half a mile distant from the camp accordingly i set out about midnight and being guided by the lowering of the cattle soon arrived at the place where i found the moors very busy drawing water i requested permission to drink but was driven away with outrageous abuse passing however from one well to another i came at last to one where there was only an old man and two boys I made the same request to this man and he immediately drew me up a bucket of water but as i was about to take hold of it he recollected that i was a christian and fearing that his bucket might be polluted by my lips 
he dashed the water into the trough and told me to drink from thence though this trough was none of the largest and three cows were already drinking from it i resolved to come in for my share and kneeling down thrust my head between two of the cows and drank with great pleasure until the water was nearly exhausted and the cows began to contend with each other for the last mouthful in adventures of this nature i passed the sultry month of may during which no material change took place in my situation ali still considered me as a lawful prisoner and fatima though she allowed me a larger quantity of victuals than i had been accustomed to receiving at benome had as yet said nothing on the subject of my release in the meantime the frequent changes of the wind the gathering clouds and distant lightning with other appearances of approaching rain indicated that the wet season was at hand when the moors annually evacuate the country of the negroes and return to the skirts of the great desert this made me consider that my fate was drawing towards a crisis and i resolved to wait for the event without any seeming uneasiness but circumstances occurred which produced a change in my favor more suddenly than i had foreseen or had reason to expect the case was this the fugitive cartans who had taken refuge in ludamar as i have related in chapter eight finding that the moors were about to leave them and dreading the resentment of their own sovereign whom they had so basely deserted offered to treat with ali for two hundred moorish horsemen to cooperate with them in an effort to dispel daisy from jedding guma for until daisy should be vanquished or humbled they considered that they could neither return to their native towns nor live in security in any of the neighboring kingdoms with a view to extort money from these people by means of this treaty ali dispatched his son to jara and prepared to follow him in the course of a few days this was an opportunity of too great consequence to me to be neglected i immediately applied to fatima who i found had the chief direction in all affairs of state and begged her interest with ali to give me permission to accompany him to jara this request after some hesitation was favorably received fatima looked kindly on me and i believe was at length moved with compassion towards me my bundles were brought from the large cowskin bag that stood in the corner of ali's tent and i was ordered to explain the use of the different articles and show the method of putting on the boots stockings etc with all which i cheerfully complied and was told that in the course of a few days i should be at liberty to depart believing therefore that i should certainly find the means of escaping from jara if i should once get thither i now freely indulged the pleasing hope that my captivity would soon terminate and happily not having been disappointed in this idea i shall pause in this place to collect and bring in one point of view such observations on the moorish character and country as i had no fair opportunity of introducing into the preceding narrative volume one chapter twelve observations on the character and country of the moors the moors of this part of africa are divided into many separate tribes of which the most formidable according to what was reported to me are those of trazart and il bracken which inhabit the northern bank of the senegal river the tribes of gedemola jaffnu and ludamar 
though not so numerous as the former are nevertheless very powerful and warlike and are each governed by a chief or king who exercises absolute jurisdiction over his own horde without acknowledging the alliance to a common sovereign in times of peace the employment of the people is pasturage the moors indeed subsist chiefly on the flesh of their cattle and are always in the extreme of either gluttony or abstinence in consequence of the frequent and severe fasts which their religion enjoins and the toilsome journeys which they sometimes undertake across the desert they are enabled to bear both hunger and thirst with surprising fortitude but whenever opportunities occur of satisfying their appetite they generally devour more at one meal than would serve a european for three they pay but little attention to agriculture purchasing their corn cotton cloth and other necessities from the negroes in exchange for salt which they dig from the pits in the great desert the natural barrenness of the country is such that it furnishes but few materials for manufacture the moors however contrive to weave a strong cloth with which they cover their tents the thread is spun by the women from the hair of goats and they prepare the hides of their cattle so as to furnish saddles bridles pouches and other articles of leather they are likewise sufficiently skilful to convert the native iron which they procure from the negroes into spears and knives and also into pots for boiling their food but their sabers and other weapons as well as their firearms and ammunition they purchase from the europeans in exchange for the negro slaves which they obtain in their predatory excursions their chief commerce of this kind is with the french traders on the senegal river the moors are rigid mohammedans and possess with the bigotry and superstition all the intolerance of their sect they have no mosque at benome but perform their devotions in a sort of open shed or enclosure made of mats the priest is at the same time schoolmaster to the juniors his pupils assemble every evening before his tent where by the light of a large fire made of brushwood and cow's dung they are taught a few sentences from the koran and are initiated into the principles of their creed their alphabet differs but little from that in richardson's arabic grammar they always write with vowel points their priests even affect to know something of foreign literature the priest of benome assured me that he could read the writings of the christians he showed me a number of barbarous characters which he asserted were the roman alphabet and he produced another specimen equally unintelligible which he declared to be the calum il indi or persian his library consisted of nine volumes in quarto most of them i believe were books on religion for the name of mohammed appeared in red letters in almost every page of each his scholars wrote their lessons upon thin boards paper being too expensive for general use the boys were diligent enough and appeared to possess a considerable share of emulation carrying the boards slung over their shoulders went about their common employments when a boy has committed to memory a few of their prayers and can read and write certain parts of the koran he is reckoned sufficiently instructed and with this slender stock of learning commences his career of life proud of his acquirements he surveys with contempt the unlettered negro and embraces every opportunity of displaying his superiority over such of his countrymen as are not distinguished by the same accomplishments the education of the girls is neglected altogether mental accomplishments are but little attended to by the women 
nor is the want of them considered by the men as a defect in the female character they are regarded i believe as an inferior species of animals and seem to be brought up for no other purpose than that of administering to the sensual pleasures of their imperious masters voluptuousness is therefore considered as their chief accomplishment and slavish submission as their indispensable duty the moors have singular ideas of feminine perfection the gracefulness of figure and motion and a countenance enlivened by expression are by no means essential points in their standard with them corpulence and beauty appear to be terms nearly synonymous a woman of even moderate pretensions must be one who cannot walk without a slave under each arm to support her and a perfect beauty is a load for a camel in consequence of this prevalent taste for unwieldiness of bulk the moorish ladies take great pains to acquire it in early life and for this purpose many of the young girls are compelled by their mothers to devour a great quantity of couscous and drink a large bowl of camel's milk every morning it is of no importance whether the girl has an appetite or not the couscous and milk must be swallowed and obedience is frequently enforced by blows i have seen a poor girl crying with the bowl at her lips for more than an hour and her mother with a stick in her hand watching her all the while and using the stick without mercy whenever she observed that her daughter was not swallowing this singular practice instead of producing indigestion and disease soon covers the young lady with that degree of plumpness which in the eye of a moor is perfection itself as the moors purchase all their clothing from the negroes the women are forced to be very economical in the article of dress in general they content themselves with a broad piece of cloth and cloth which is wrapped round the middle and hangs down like a petticoat almost to the ground to the upper part of this are sewed two square pieces one before and the other behind which are fastened together over the shoulders the headdress is commonly a bandage of cloth and cloth with some parts of it broader than others which serve to conceal the face when they walk in the sun frequently however when they go abroad they veil themselves from head to foot the employment of the women varies according to their degrees of opulence queen fatima and a few others of a high rank like the great ladies in some parts of europe pass their time chiefly in conversing with their visitors performing their devotions or admiring their charms in the looking-glass the women of inferior class employ themselves in different domestic duties they are very vain and talkative and when anything puts them out of humor they commonly vent their anger upon their female slaves over whom they rule with severe and despotic authority which leads me to observe that the condition of these poor captives is deplorably wretched at daybreak they are compelled to fetch water from the wells in large skins called gerbas and as soon as they have brought water enough to serve the family for the day as well as the horses for the moors seldom give their horses the trouble of going to the wells they are then employed in pounding the corn and dressing the victuals this being always done in the open air the slaves are exposed to the combined heat of the sun the sand and the fire in the intervals it is their business to sweep the tent churn the milk and perform other domestic offices with all this they are badly fed and oftentimes cruelly punished the men's dress among the moors of ludamar differs but little from that of the negroes which has already been described 
except that they have all adopted that characteristic of the mohammedan sect the turban which is here universally made of white cotton cloth such of the moors as have long beards displayed them with a mixture of pride and satisfaction as denoting an arab ancestry of this number was ali himself but among the generality of the people the hair is short and busy and universally black and here i may be permitted to observe that if any one circumstance excited them favorable thoughts toward my own person it was my beard which was now grown to an enormous length and was always beheld with approbation or envy i believe my conscience they thought it too good a beard for a christian the only diseases which i observed to prevail among the moors were the intermittent fever and dysentery for the cure of which nostrums are sometimes administered by their old women but in general nature is left to her own operations mention was made to me of the smallpox as being sometimes very destructive but it had not to my knowledge made its appearance in ludamar while i was in captivity that it prevails however among some tribes of the moors and that it is frequently conveyed by them to the negroes in the southern states i was assured on the authority of dr Laidley, who also informed me that the negroes on the gambia practice inoculation the administration of criminal justice as far as i had opportunities of observing was prompt and decisive for although civil rights were but little regarded in ludamar it was necessary when crimes were committed that examples should sometimes be made on such occasions the offender was brought before ali who pronounced of his sole authority what judgment he thought proper but i understood that capital punishment was seldom or never inflicted except on the negroes although the wealth of the moors consists chiefly in their numerous herds of cattle yet as a pastoral life does not afford full employment the majority of the people are perfectly idle and spend the day in trifling conversation about their horses or in laying schemes of depredation on the negro villages of the number of ali's moor subjects i had no means of forming a correct estimate the military strength of ludamar consists in cavalry they are well mounted and appear to be very expert in skirmishing and attacking by surprise every soldier furnishes his own horse and finds his acuments consisting of a large sabre a double-barrel gun a small red leather bag for holding his balls and a powder bag slung over the shoulder he has no pay nor any remuneration but what arises from plunder this body is not very numerous for when ali made war upon bambara i was informed that his whole force did not exceed two thousand cavalry they constitute however by what i could learn but a very small proportion of his moorish subjects the horses are very beautiful and so highly esteemed that the negro princes will sometimes give from twelve to fourteen slaves for one horse ludamar has for its northern boundary the great desert of sahara from the best inquiries i could make this vast ocean of sand which occupies so large a space in northern africa may be pronounced almost destitute of inhabitants except where the scanty vegetation which appears in certain spots affords pasturage for the flocks of a few miserable arabs who wander from one well to another in other places where the supply of water and pasturage is far more abundant small parties of the moors have taken up their residence here they live 
in independent poverty secure from the tyrannical government of barbary but the greater part of the desert being totally destitute of water is seldom visited by any human being unless where the trading caravans trace out their toilsome and dangerous route across it in some parts of this extensive waste the ground is covered with low stunted shrubs which serve as landmarks for the caravans and furnish the camels with scanty forage in other parts of the disconsolate wanderer wherever he turns sees nothing around him but a vast interminable expanse of sand and sky a gloomy and barren void where the eye finds no particular object to rest upon and the mind is filled with painful apprehensions of perishing with thirst the few wild animals which inhabit these melancholy regions are the antelope and the ostrich their swiftness of foot enabling them to reach the distant watering places on the skirts of the desert where water is more plentiful are found lions panthers elephants and wild bears of domestic animals the only one that can endure the fatigue of crossing the desert is the camel by the particular conformation of the stomach he is enabled to carry a supply of water sufficient for ten or twelve days his broad and yielding foot is well adapted for a sandy country and by a singular motion of his upper lip he picks the smallest leaves from the thorny shrubs of the desert as he passes along the camel is therefore the only beast of burden employed by the trading caravans which traverse the desert in different directions from barbary to negrita as this useful and docile creature has been sufficiently described by systematical writers it is unnecessary for me to enlarge upon his properties i shall only add that his flesh though to my own taste dry and unsavory is preferred by the moors to any other and that the milk of the female is in universal esteem and is indeed sweet pleasant and nutritive i have observed that the moors in their complexion resemble the mulattoes of the west indies but they have something unpleasant in their aspect which the mulattoes have not i fancy that i discovered in the features of most of them a disposition towards cruelty and low cunning and i could never contemplate their physiognomy without feeling sensible uneasiness from the staring wildness of their eyes a stranger would immediately set them down as a nation of lunatics the treachery and malevolence of their character are manifest in their plundering excursions against the negro villages oftentimes without the smallest provocation and sometimes under the fairest professions of friendship they will suddenly seize upon the negroes cattle and even on the inhabitants themselves the negroes very seldom retaliate like the roving arabs the moors frequently remove from one place to another according to the season of the year or the convenience of pasturage in the month of february when the heat of the sun scorches up every sort of vegetation in the desert they strike their tents and approach the negro country to the south where they reside until the rains commence in the month of july at this time having purchased corn and other necessities from the negroes in exchange for salt they again depart to the northward and continue in the desert until the rains are over and that part of the country becomes burnt up and barren this wandering and restless way of life which it inures them to hardships strengthens at the same time the bonds of their little society and creates in them an aversion towards strangers 
which is almost unsurmountable cut off from all intercourse with civilized nations and boasting an advantage over the negroes by possessing through a very limited degree the knowledge of letters they are at once the vainest and proudest and perhaps the most bigoted ferocious and intolerant of all the nations on the earth combining in their character the blind superstition of the negro with the savage cruelty and treachery of the arab volume one chapter thirteen escape from captivity having as hath been related obtained permission to accompany ali to jara i took leave of queen fatima who with much grace and civility returned me part of my apparel and the evening before my departure my horse with the saddle and bridle were sent me by ali's order early on the morning of the twenty sixth of may i departed from the camp of Bubaker, accompanied by my two attendants johnson and demba and a number of moors on horseback ali with about fifty horsemen having gone privately from the camp during the night we stopped about noon at forani and were there joined by twelve moors riding upon camels and with them we proceeded to a watering place in the woods where we overtook ali and his fifty horsemen they were lodged in some low shepherd's tents near the wells may twenty eighth early in the morning the moors saddled their horses and ali's chief slave ordered me to get in readiness in a little time the same messenger returned and taking my boy by the shoulder told him in the mandingo language that ali was to be his master in future and then turning to me the business is settled at last said he the boy and everything but your horse goes back to brubaker but you may take the old fool meaning johnson the interpreter with you to jara i made him no answer but being shocked beyond description at the idea of losing the poor boy i hastened to ali who was at breakfast before his tent surrounded by many of his courtiers i told him perhaps in rather too passionate a strain that whatever imprudence i had been guilty of in coming into his country i thought i had already been sufficiently punished for it by being so long detained and then plundered of all my little property which however gave me no uneasiness when compared with what he had just done now to me i observed that the boy whom he now seized upon was not a slave and had been accused of no offence he was indeed one of my attendants and his faithful services in that station had procured him his freedom his fidelity and attachment had made him follow me into my present situation and as he looked up to me for protection i could not see him deprived of his liberty without remonstrating against such an act as the height of cruelty and injustice ali made no reply but with a haughty air and malignant smile told his interpreter that if i did not mount my horse immediately he would send me back likewise there is something in the frown of a tyrant which rouses the most secret emotions of the heart i could not suppress my feelings and for once entertained an indignant wish to rid the world of such a monster poor demba was no less affected than myself he had formed a strong attachment towards me and had a cheerfulness of disposition which often beguiled the tedious hours of captivity he was likewise a proficient in the bambara tongue and promised on that account to be of great utility to me in future 
but it was in vain to expect anything favorable to humanity from people who are strangers to his dictates so having shaken hands with this unfortunate boy and blended my tears with his assuring him however that i would do my utmost to redeem him i saw him led off by three of ali's slaves towards the camp at brubaker when the moors had mounted their horses i was ordered to follow them and after a toilsome journey through the woods in a very sultry day we arrived in the afternoon at a walled village called dumbani where we remained two days waiting for the arrival of some horsemen from the northward on the first of june we departed from dumbani towards jera our company now amounted to two hundred men all on horseback for the moors never use infantry in their wars they appeared capable of enduring great fatigue but from their total want of discipline our journey to jera was more like fox chase than the march of an army at jera i took my lodging at the house of my old acquaintance damon jumba and informed him of everything that had befallen me i particularly requested him to use his interest with ali to redeem my boy and promised him a bill upon dr laidley for the value of two slaves the moment he brought him to jera damon very readily undertook to negotiate the business but found that ali considered the boy as my principal interpreter and was unwilling to part with him lest he should fall a second time into my hands and be instrumental in conducting me to bambara ali therefore put off the matter from day to day but withal told damon that if he wished to purchase the boy for himself he should have him thereafter at the common price of a slave which damon agreed to pay for him whenever ali should send him to jara the chief object of ali in this journey to jara as i have already related was to procure money from such as the cartans as had taken refuge in his country some of these had solicited his protection to avoid the horrors of war but by far the greatest number of them were dissatisfied men who wished the ruin of their own sovereign these people no sooner heard that the bambara army had returned to sago without subduing daisy as was generally expected then they resolved to make a sudden attack themselves upon him before he could recruit his forces which were now known to be much diminished by a bloody campaign and in great want of provisions with this view they solicited the moors to join them and offered to hire of ali two hundred horsemen which ali with the warmest professions of friendship agreed to furnish upon condition that they should previously supply him with four hundred head of cattle two hundred garments of blue cloth and a considerable quantity of beads and ornaments june eighth in the afternoon ali sent his chief slave to inform me that he was about to return to Brew baker but as he would only stay there a few days to keep the approaching festival banna sali and then return to jara i had permission to remain with damon until his return this was joyful news to me but i had experienced so many disappointments that i was unwilling to indulge the hope of its being true until johnson came and told me that ali with part of the horsemen were actually gone from the town and that the rest were to follow him in the morning june ninth early in the morning the remainder of the moors departed from town they had during their stay 
committed many acts of robbery and this morning with the most unparalleled audacity they seized upon three girls who were bringing water from the wells and carried them away into slavery june twelfth two people dreadfully wounded were discovered at a watering place in the woods one of them had just breathed his last but the other was brought alive to jera on recovering a little he informed the people that he had fled through the woods from casson that daisy had made war upon sambo the king of that country had surprised three of his towns and put all the inhabitants to the sword he enumerated by name many of the friends of the jara people who had been murdered in casson this intelligence made the death howl universal in jara for the space of two days this piece of bad news was followed by another not less distressing a number of runaway slaves arrived from carta on the fourteenth and reported that daisy having received information concerning the intended attack upon him was about to visit jara this made the negroes call upon ali for the two hundred horsemen which he was to furnish them according to engagement but ali paid very little attention to their remonstrances and at last plainly told them that his cavalry were otherwise employed the negroes thus deserted by the moors and fully apprised that the king of carta would show them as little clemency as he had shown the inhabitants of casson resolved to collect all their forces and hazard a battle before the king who was now in great distress for want of provisions should become too powerful for them they therefore assembled about eight hundred effective men in the whole and with these they entered carta on the evening of the eighteenth of june june nineteenth this morning the wind shifted to the southwest and about two o'clock in the afternoon we had a heavy tornado or thunder squall accompanied with rain which greatly revived the face of nature and gave a pleasant coolness to the air this was the first rain that had fallen for many months as every attempt to redeem my boy had hitherto been unsuccessful and in all probability would continue to prove so whilst i remained in the country i found that it was necessary for me to come to some determination concerning my own safety before the rain should be fully set in for my landlord seeing no likelihood of being paid for his trouble began to wish me away and johnson my interpreter refusing to proceed my situation became very perplexing i determined to avail myself of the first opportunity of escaping and to proceed directly for bambara as soon as the rains had set in for a few days so as to afford me the certainty of finding water in the woods such was my situation when on the evening of the twenty fourth of june i was startled by the report of some muskets close to the town and inquiring the reason was informed that the jara army had returned from fighting daisy and that this firing was by way of rejoicing however when the chief men of the town had assembled and heard a full detail of the expedition they were by no means relieved from their uneasiness on daisy's account the deceitful moors having drawn back from the confederacy after being hired by the negroes greatly dispirited the insurgents who instead of finding daisy with a few friends concealed in the strong fortress of gedogenoma had found him at a town near joka in the open country surrounded by so numerous an army 
that every attempt to attack him was at once given up and the confederates only thought of enriching themselves by the plunder of the small towns in the neighborhood they accordingly fell upon one of daisy's towns and carried off the whole of the inhabitants but less intelligence of this might reach daisy and induce him to cut off their retreat they returned through the woods by night bringing with them the slaves and cattle which they had captured june twenty sixth this afternoon a spy from carta brought the alarming intelligence that daisy had taken simbing in the morning and would be in jara some time in the course of the ensuing day early in the morning nearly one half of the town's people took the road for bambara by the way of dina their departure was very affecting the women and children crying the men sullen and dejected and all of them looking back with regret on their native town and on the wells and rocks beyond which their ambition had never tempted them to stray where they had laid all their plans of future happiness all of which they were now forced to abandon and to seek shelter among strangers june twenty seventh about eleven o'clock in the forenoon we were alarmed by the sentinels who brought information that daisy was on his march towards jera and that the confederate army had fled before him without firing a gun the terror of the townspeople on this occasion is not easily to be described indeed the screams of the women and children and the great hurry and confusion that everywhere prevailed made me suspect that the cartans had already entered the town and although i had every reason to be pleased with daisy's behavior to me when i was at camu i had no wish to expose myself to the mercy of his army who might in the general confusion mistake me for a moor i therefore mounted my horse and taking a large bag of corn before me rode slowly along with the townspeople until we reached the foot of a rocky hill where i dismounted and drove my horse up before me when i had reached the summit i sat down and having a full view of the town and the neighboring country could not help lamenting the situation of the poor inhabitants who were thronging after me driving their sheep cows goats etc and carrying a scanty portion of provisions and a few clothes there was a great noise and crying everywhere upon the road for many aged people and children were unable to walk and these with the sick were obliged to be carried otherwise they must have been left to certain destruction about five o'clock we arrived at a small farm belonging to the jara people called kajia and here i found damon and johnson employed in filling large bags of corn to be carried upon bullocks to serve as provisions for damon's family on the road june twenty eighth at daybreak we departed from kajia and having passed trongobana without stopping arrived in the afternoon at quira i remained here two days in order to recruit my horse which the moors had reduced to a perfect rosiante and to wait for the arrival of some mandingo negroes who were going for bambara in the course of a few days on the afternoon of the first of july as i was tending my horse in the fields ali chief slave and four moors arrived at quira and took up their lodging at the duty's house my interpreter johnson who suspected the nature of this visit sent two boys to overhear their conversation from which he learnt that they were sent to convey me back to brubaker 
the same evening two of the moors came privately to look at my horse and one of them proposed taking it to the duty's hut but the other observed that such a precaution was unnecessary as i could never escape upon such an animal they then inquired where i slept and returned to their companions all this was like a stroke of thunder to me for i dreaded nothing so much as confinement again among the moors from whose barbarity i had nothing but death to expect i therefore determined to set off immediately for bambera a measure which i thought offered almost the only chance of saving my life and gaining the object of my mission i communicated the design to johnson who although he applauded my resolution was so far from showing any inclination to accompany me that he solemnly protested he would rather forfeit his wages than go any farther he told me that damon had agreed to give him half the price of a slave for his service to assist in conducting a coffle of slaves to gambia and that he was determined to embrace the opportunity of returning to his wife and family having no hopes therefore of persuading him to accompany me i resolved to proceed by myself about midnight i got my clothes in readiness which consisted of two shirts two pairs of trousers two pocket handkerchiefs an upper and under waistcoat a mat and a pair of half boots these with a cloak constituted my whole wardrobe and i had not one single bead or any other article of value in my possession to purchase victuals for myself or corn for my horse about daybreak johnson who had been listening to the moors all night came and whispered to me that they were asleep the awful crisis was now arrived when i was again either to taste the blessing of freedom or languish out my days in captivity a cold sweat moistened my forehead as i thought on the dreadful alternative and reflected that one way or another my fate must be decided in the course of the ensuing day but to deliberate was to lose the only chance of escaping so taking up my bundle i stepped gently over the negroes who were sleeping in the open air and having mounted my horse i bade johnson farewell desiring him to take particular care of the papers i had entrusted him with and inform my friends in gambia that he had left me in good health on my way to bambara i proceeded with great caution surveying each bush and frequently listening and looking behind me for the moorish horsemen until i was about a mile from the town when i was surprised to find myself in the neighbourhood of a corrie belonging to the moors the shepherds followed me for about a mile hooting and throwing stones after me and when i was out of their reach and had begun to indulge the pleasing hope of escaping i was again greatly alarmed to hear somebody hola behind me and looking back i saw three moors on horseback coming after me at full speed whooping and brandishing their double-barreled guns i knew it was in vain to think of escaping and therefore turned back and met them when two of them caught hold of my bridle one on each side and the third presenting his musket told me i must go back to ali when the human mind has for some time been fluctuating between hope and despair tortured with anxiety and hurried from one extreme to the other it affords a sort of gloomy relief to know the worst that can possibly happen such was my situation an indifference about life and all its enjoyments had completely benumbed my faculties and i rode back with the moors 
with apparent unconcern but a change took place much sooner than i had any reason to expect in passing through some thick bushes one of the moors ordered me to untie my bundle and show them the contents having examined the different articles they found nothing worth taking except my cloak which they considered a very valuable acquisition and one of them pulling it from me wrapped it about himself and with one of his companions rode off with their prize when i attempted to follow them the third who had remained with me struck my horse over the head and presenting his musket told me i should proceed no farther i now perceived that these men had not been sent by any authority to apprehend me but had pursued me solely with a view to rob and plunder me turning my horse's head therefore once more toward the east and observing the moor follow the tracks of his confederates i congratulated myself on having escaped with my life though in great distress from such a horde of barbarians i was no sooner out of the sight of the moor than i struck into the woods to prevent being pursued and kept pushing on with all possible speed until i found myself near some high rocks which i remembered to have seen in my former route from quira to dina and directing my course a little to the northward i fortunately fell in with the path volume one chapter fourteen journey continued arrival at wara it is impossible to describe the joy that arose in my mind when i looked around and concluded that i was out of danger i felt like one recovered from sickness i breathed freer i found unusual lightness in my limbs even the desert looked pleasant and i dreaded nothing so much as falling in with some wandering parties of moors who might convey me back to the land of thieves and murderers from which i had just escaped i soon became sensible however that my situation was very deplorable for i had no means of procuring food nor prospect of finding water about ten o'clock perceiving a herd of goats feeding close to the road i took a circuitous route to avoid being seen and continued travelling through the wilderness directing my course by compass nearly east southeast in order to reach as soon as possible some town or village of the kingdom of bambara a little after noon when the burning heat of the sun was reflected with double violence from the hot sand and the distant bridges of the hills seen through the ascending vapour seemed to wave and fluctuate like the unsettled sea i became faint with thirst and climbed a tree in hopes of seeing distant smoke or some other appearance of human habitation but in vain nothing appeared all around but thick underwood and hillocks of white sand about four o'clock i came suddenly upon a large herd of goats and pulling my horse into a bush i watched to observe if the keepers were moors or negroes in a little time i perceived two moorish boys and with some difficulty persuaded them to approach me they informed me that the herd belonged to ali and that they were going to dina where the water was more plentiful and where they intended to stay until the rain had filled the pools in the desert they showed me their empty water skins and told me that they had seen no water in the woods this account afforded me but little consolation however it was in vain to repine and i pushed on as fast as possible in hopes of reaching some watering place in the course of the night my thirst was by this time becoming insufferable my mouth was parched and inflamed a sudden dimness would frequently come over my eyes with other symptoms of fainting and my horse being very much fatigued 
i began seriously to apprehend that i should perish of thirst to relieve the burning pain in my mouth and throat i chewed the leaves of different shrubs but found them all bitter and of no service to me a little before sunset having reached the top of a gentle rising i climbed a high tree from the topmost branches of which i cast a melancholy look over the barren wilderness but without discovering the most distant trace of a human dwelling the same dismal uniformity of shrubs and sand everywhere presented itself and the horizon was a, as level and uninterrupted as that of the sea descending from the tree i found my horse devouring the stubble and brushwood with great avidity and as i was now too faint to attempt walking and my horse too much fatigued to carry me i thought it but an act of humanity and perhaps the last i should ever have in my power to perform to take off his bridle and let him shift for himself in doing what i was suddenly affected with sickness and giddiness and falling upon the sand felt as if the hour of death was fast approaching here then thought i after a short but ineffectual struggle terminate all my hopes of being useful in my day and generation here must the short span of my life come to an end i cast as i believed a last look on the surrounding scene and whilst i reflected on the awful change that was about to take place this world with its enjoyment seemed to vanish from my recollection nature however at length resumed its functions and on recovering my senses i found myself stretched upon the sand with the bridle still in my hand and the sun just sinking behind the trees i now summoned all my resolution and determined to make another effort to prolong my existence and as the evening was somewhat cool i resolved to travel as far as my limbs would carry me in hopes of reaching my only resource a watering place with this view i put the bridle on my horse and driving him before me went slowly along for about an hour when i perceived some lightning from the northeast a most delightful sight for it promised rain the darkness and lightning increased very rapidly and in less than an hour i heard the wind roaring among the bushes i had already opened my mouth to receive the refreshing drops which i expected but i was instantly covered with a cloud of sand driven with such a force by the wind as to give a very disagreeable sensation to my face and arms and i was obliged to mount my horse and stop under a bush to prevent being suffocated the sand continued to fly in amazing quantities for nearly an hour after which i again set forward and travelled with difficulty until ten o'clock about this time i was agreeably surprised by some very vivid flashes of lightning followed by a few heavy drops of rain in a little time the sand ceased to fly and i alighted and spread out all my clean clothes to collect the rain which at length i saw would certainly fall for more than an hour it rained plentifully and i quenched my thirst by wringing and sucking my clothes there being no moon it was remarkably dark so that i was obliged to lead my horse and direct my way by the compass which the lightning enabled me to observe in this manner i travelled with tolerable expectation until past midnight when the lightning becoming more distant i was under the necessity of groping along to the no small danger of my hands and eyes about two o'clock my horse started at something and looking round i was not a little surprised to see a light at a short distance among the trees and supposing it be a town i groped along the sand 
in hopes of finding corn stalks cotton or other appearances of cultivation but found none as i approached i perceived a number of other lights in different places and began to suspect that i had fallen upon a party of moors however in my present situation i was resolved to see who they were if i could do it with safety i accordingly led my horse cautiously towards the light and heard by the lowing of the cattle and the clamorous tongues of the herdsmen that it was a watering place and most likely belonged to the moors delightful as the sound of a human voice was to me i resolved once more to strike into the woods and rather run the risk of perishing of hunger than to trust myself again in their hands but being still thirsty and dreading the approach of the burning day i thought it prudent to search for the wells which i expected to find at no great distance in this purpose i inadvertently approached so near to one of the tents as to be perceived by a woman who immediately screamed out two people came running to her assistance from some of the neighboring tents and passed so very near to me that i thought i was discovered and hastened again into the woods about a mile from this place i heard a loud and confused noise somewhere to the right of my course and in a short time was happy to find it was the croaking of frogs which was heavenly music to my ears i followed the sound and at daybreak arrived at some shallow muddy pools so full of frogs that it was difficult to discern the water the noise they made frightened my horse and i was obliged to keep them quiet by beating the water with a branch until he had drunk having here quenched my thirst i ascended a tree and the morning being calm i soon perceived the smoke of the watering place which i had passed in the night and observed another pillar of smoke east southeast distant twelve or fourteen miles towards this i directed my route and reached the cultivated ground a little before eleven o'clock where seeing a number of negroes at work planting corn i inquired the name of the town and was informed that it was a fula village belonging to ali called shrilla i had now some doubts about entering it but my horse being very much fatigued and the day growing hot not to mention the pangs of hunger which began to assail me i resolved to venture and accordingly rode up to the duty's house where i was unfortunately denied admittance and could not obtain even a handful of corn either for myself or horse turning from this inhospitable door i rode slowly out of the town and perceiving some low scattered huts without walls i directed my route towards them knowing that in africa as well as in europe hospitality does not always prefer the highest dwellings at the door of one of these huts an old motherly-looking woman sat spinning cotton i made signs to her that i was hungry and inquired if she had any victuals with her in the hut she immediately laid down her distaff and desired me in arabic to come in when i had seated myself upon the floor she set before me a dish of couscous that had been left the preceding night of which i made a tolerable meal and in return for this kindness i gave her one of my pocket handkerchiefs begging at the same time a little corn for my horse which she readily brought me whilst my horse was feeding the people began to assemble and one of them whispered something to my hostess which very much excited her surprise though i was not well acquainted with the fula language i soon discovered that some of the men wished to apprehend and carry me back to ali in hopes i suppose of receiving a reward 
I therefore tied up the corn, and lest any one should suspect I had run away from the moors, I took northerly direction and went cheerfully along, driving my horse before me, followed by all the boys and girls of the town. When I had travelled about two miles and got quit of all my troublesome attendants, I struck again into the woods and took shelter under a large tree where i found it necessary to rest myself a bundle of twigs serving me for a bed and my saddle for a pillow july fourth at daybreak i pursued my course through the woods as formerly saw numbers of antelopes wild hogs and ostriches but the soil was more hilly and not so fertile as I have found it the preceding day. About eleven o'clock I ascended an eminence, where I climbed a tree and discovered, at about eight miles distance, an open part of the country, with several red spots, which I concluded were cultivated land, and, directing my course that way, came to the precincts of a watering place about one o'clock. From the appearance of the place, I judged it to belong to the Fulas, and was hopeful that I should meet a better reception than I had experienced at Shrilla. In this I was not deceived, for one of the shepherds invited me to come into his tent and partake of some dates. This was one of those low Fula tents in which there is room just sufficient to sit upright, and in which the family the furniture etc seemed huddled together like so many articles in a chest when i had crept upon my hands and knees into this humble habitation i found that it contained a woman and three children who together with the shepherd and myself completely occupied the floor a dish of boiled corn and dates was produced and the master of the family as is customary in this part of the country first tasted it himself and then desired me to follow his example whilst i was eating the children kept their eyes fixed upon me and no sooner did the shepherd pronounce the word nazanari than they began to cry and their mother crept slowly towards the door out of which she sprang like a greyhound and was instantly followed by her children so frightened were they at the very name of a christian that no entreaties could induce them to approach the tent here i purchased some corn for my horse in exchange for some brass buttons and having thanked the shepherd for his hospitality struck again into the woods at sunset i came to a road that took the direction for bambera and resolved to follow it for the night but about eight o'clock hearing some people coming from the southward i thought it prudent to hide myself among some thick bushes near the road as these thickets are generally full of wild beasts i found my situation rather unpleasant sitting in the dark holding my horse by the nose with both hands to prevent him from neighing and equally afraid of the natives without and the wild beasts within my fears however were soon dissipated for the people after looking round the thicket and perceiving nothing went away and i hastened to the more open parts of the wood where i pursued my journey east southeast until past midnight when the joyful cry of frogs induced me once more to deviate a little from my route in order to quench my thirst having accomplished this from a large pool of rainwater i sought for an open place with a single tree in the midst under which i made my bed for the night i was disturbed by some wolves towards morning which induced me to set forward a little before day and having passed a small village called wasilita i came about ten o'clock july fifth to a negro town called walra 
which properly belongs to Carta, but was at this time tributary to Mansong, king of Bambara. Volume 1, Chapter 15 Negro Curiosity A Message from the King Wara is a small town surrounded with high walls and inhabited by a mixture of mandingos and fulas the inhabitants employ themselves chiefly in cultivating corn which they exchange with the moors for salt here being in security from the moors and very much fatigue i resolved to rest myself and meeting with a hearty welcome from the duty whose name was flancherry I laid myself down upon a bullock's hide and slept soundly for about two hours the curiosity of the people would not allow me to sleep any longer they had seen my saddle and bridle and were assembled in great numbers to learn who i was and whence i came some were of opinion that i was an arab others insisted that i was some moorish sultan and they continued to debate the matter with such warmth that the noise awoke me the duty who had formerly been at gambia had last interposed in my behalf and assured them that i was certainly a white man but he was convinced from my appearance that i was a poor one july sixth it rained very much in the night and at daylight i departed in company with a negro who was going to a town called dingi for corn but we had not proceeded above a mile before the ass upon which he rode threw him off and he returned leaving me to prosecute the journey by myself i reached dingi about noon but the duty and most of the inhabitants had gone into the fields to cultivate corn an old fula observing me wandering about the town desired me to come to his hut where i was well entertained and the duty when he returned sent me some victuals for myself and corn for my horse july seventh in the morning when i was about to depart my landlord with a great deal of diffidence begged me to give him a lock of my hair he had been told he said that white men's hair made a safi that would give to the possessor all the knowledge of white men i had never before heard of so simple a mode of education but instantly complied with the request i reached a small town called wasabo about twelve o'clock where i was obliged to stop until an opportunity should offer of procuring a guide to satali which is distant a very long day's journey through woods without any beaten path i accordingly took up my residence at the duty's house where i stayed four days during which time i amused myself by going to the fields with the family to plant corn cultivation is carried on here on a very extensive scale and as the natives themselves express it hunger is never known in cultivating the soil the men and women work together they use a large sharp hoe much superior to that used in gambia but they are obliged for fear of the moors to carry their arms with them to the field the master with the handle of his spear marks the field into regular plats one of which is assigned to every three slaves on the evening of the eleventh eight of the fugitive cartans arrived at wasabu they had found it impossible to live under the tyrannical government of the moors and were now going to transfer their allegiance to the king of bambara they offered to take me along with them as far as satil and i accepted the offer july twelfth at daybreak we set out and travelled with uncommon expedition until sunset we stopped only twice in the course of the day once at a watering place in the woods and at another time at the ruins of a town formerly belonging to daisy 
called Ila Comp, the corn town. When we arrived in the neighborhood of Satil, the people who were employed in the cornfields, seeing so many horsemen, took us for a party of moors and ran screaming away from us. The whole town was instantly alarmed, and the slaves were seen in every direction driving the cattle and horses towards the town. It was in vain that one of our company galloped up to undeceive them. It only frightened them the more, and we arrived at the town we found the gate shut, and the people all under arms. After a long parley we were permitted to enter, and, as there was every appearance of a tornado, the duty allowed us to sleep in his balloon, and gave us each a bullock's hide for a bed. July 13th. Early in the morning we again set forward. The roads wet and slippery, but the country was very beautiful, abounding with rivulets, which were increased by the rain into rapid streams. About ten o'clock we came to the rains of a village, which had been destroyed by the war about six months before. About noon my horse was much fatigued that I could not keep up with my companions. I therefore dismounted and desired them to ride on, telling them that I would follow as soon as my horse had rested a little. But I found them unwilling to leave me. The lions, they said, were very numerous in those parts, and although they might not so readily attack a body of people, they would soon find out an individual. It was therefore agreed that one of the company should stay with me to assist in driving my horse, while the others passed on to Galu to procure lodgings and collect grass for the horses before night. Accompanied by this worthy negro, I drove my horse before me until about four o'clock, when we came in sight of Galu, a considerable town standing in a fertile and beautiful valley surrounded with high rocks. Early next morning, July 14th, having first returned many thanks to our landlord for his hospitality, while my fellow travellers offered up their prayers that he might never want, we set forward and about three o'clock arrived at Mordra, a large town famous for its trade in salt, which the Moors bring here in great quantities to exchange for corn and cotton cloth. As most of the people here are Mohammedans, it is not allowed to the Kafirs to drink beer, which they called Neodolo, corn spirit, except in certain houses. In one of these I saw about twenty people sitting round large vessels of this beer with the greatest conviviality, many of them in a state of intoxication. On the morning of the 16th, we again set forward, accompanied by a coffle of fourteen asses, loaded with salt, bound for San Sanding. The road was particularly romantic, between two rocky hills, but the moors sometimes lie in wait here to plunder strangers. As soon as we had reached the open country, the master of the salt coffle thanked us for having stayed with him so long, and now desired us to ride on. The sun was almost set before we reached Talibu. In the evening we had a most tremendous tornado, the house in which we lodged being flat-roofed. Amidst the rain in streams, the floor was soon ankle-deep, the fire extinguished, and we were left to pass the night upon some bundles of firewood that happened to lie in a corner. July 17th, we departed from Datalabu, and about ten o'clock passed a large coffle returning from Sago with corn hoes, mats, and other household utensils. At five o'clock we came to a large village where we intended to pass the night, but the duty would not receive us. When we departed from this place, my horse was so much fatigued that I was under the necessity of driving him, 
and it was dark before we reached fanibu a small village the duty of which no sooner heard that i was a white man than he brought out three old muskets and was much disappointed when he was told that i could not repair them july eighteenth we continued our journey but owing to a light supper the preceding night we felt ourselves rather hungry this morning and endeavored to procure some corn at a village but without success my horse becoming weaker and weaker every day was now of very little service to me i was obliged to drive him before me for the greater part of the day and did not reach geosoro until eight o'clock in the evening i found my companions wrangling with the duty who had absolutely refused to give or sell them any provisions and as none of us had tasted victuals for the last twenty-four hours we were by no means disposed to fast another day if we could help it but finding our entreaties without effect and being very much fatigued i fell asleep from which i was awakened about midnight with the joyful information kininata the victuals are come this made the remainder of the night pass away pleasantly and at daybreak july nineteenth we resumed our journey proposing to stop at a village called du link ebu for the night following my fellow travellers having better horses than myself soon left me and i was walking barefoot driving my horse when i was met by a coffle of slaves about seventy in number coming from sago they were tied together by their necks with thongs of a bullock's hide twisted like a rope seven slaves upon a thong and a man with a musket between every seven many of the slaves were ill-conditioned and a great number of them women in the rear came sidi mohammed's servant whom i remembered to have seen at the camp of benom he presently knew me and told me that these slaves were going to morocco by way of ludamar and the great desert in the afternoon as i approached du link abu i met about twenty moors on horseback the owners of the slaves i had seen in the morning they were well armed with muskets and were very inquisitive concerning me but not so rude as their countrymen generally are from them i learnt that sidi mahomed was not at sago but had gone to kakaba for gold dust when i arrived at du link abu i was informed that my fellow travellers had gone on but my horse was so much fatigued that i could not possibly proceed after them the duty of the town at my request gave me a draught of water which is generally looked upon as an earnest of greater hospitality and i had no doubt of making up for the toils of the day by a good supper and a sound sleep unfortunately i had neither the one or the other the night was rainy and tempestuous, and the duty limited his hospitality to the draught of water july twentieth in the morning i endeavoured both by entreaties and threats to procure some victuals from the duty but in vain i even begged some corn from one of his female slaves as she was washing it at the well and had the mortification to be refused however when the duty was gone to the fields his wife sent me a handful of meal which i mixed with water and drank for breakfast about eight o'clock i departed from du link abu and at a noon stopped a few minutes at a large koree where i had some milk given me by the fulas and hearing that two negroes were going from thence to sega i was happy to have their company and we set out immediately about four o'clock we stopped at a small village where one of the negroes met with an acquaintance who invited us to a sort of public entertainment 
which was conducted with more than common propriety a dish made of sour milk and meal called sink a two and beer made from their corn was distributed with great liberality and the women were admitted into the society a circumstance i had never before observed in africa there was no compulsion every one was at liberty to drink as he pleased they nodded to each other when about to drink and on setting down the calabash commonly said burka thank you both men and women appeared to be somewhat intoxicated but they were far from being quarrelsome departing from thence we passed several large villages where i was constantly taken for a moor and became the subject of much merriment to the bambarans who seeing me drive my horse before me laughed heartily at my appearance he has been at mecca said one you may see that by his clothes another asked me if my horse was sick a third wished to purchase it etc so that i believe the very slaves were ashamed to be seen in my company just before it was dark we took up our lodging for the night at a small village where i procured some victuals for myself and some corn for my horse at the moderate price of a button and was told that i should see the niger which the negroes call joliba or the great water early the next day the lions are here very numerous the gates are shut a little after sunset and nobody allowed to go out the thoughts of seeing the niger in the morning and the troublesome buzzing of mosquitoes prevented me from shutting my eyes during the night and i had saddled my horse and was in readiness before daylight but on account of the wild beasts we were obliged to wait until the people were stirring and the gates were opened this happened to be a market day at sego and the roads were everywhere filled with people carrying different articles to sell we passed four large villages and at eight o'clock saw the smoke over sego as we approached the town i was fortunate enough to overtake the fugitive cartans to whose kindness i had been so much indebted in my journey through bambara they readily agreed to introduce me to the king and we rode together through some marshy ground where as i was anxiously looking around for the river one of them called out geo afili see the water and looking forwards i saw with infinite pleasure the great object of my mission the long sought for majestic niger glittering in the morning sun as broad as the thames at westminster and flowing slowly to the eastward i hastened to the brink and having drunk of the water lifted up my fervent thanks in prayer to the great ruler of all things for having thus far crowned my endeavors with success the circumstances of the niger's flowing towards the east and its collateral points did not however excite my surprise for although i had left europe in great hesitation on this subject and rather believed it ran in the contrary direction i had made such frequent inquiries during my progress concerning this river and received from negroes of different nations such clear and decisive assurances that its general course was towards the rising sun as scarce left any doubt on my mind and more especially as i knew that major houghton had collected similar information in the same manner sago the capital of bambara at which i now arrived consists properly speaking of four distinct towns two on the northern bank of the niger called sago caro and sago bu and two on the southern bank called sago su caro and sago si caro 
They all are surrounded with high mud walls. The houses are built of clay, of a square form with flat roofs. Some of them have two stories, and many of them are whitewashed. Besides these buildings, Moorish mosques are seen in every quarter, and the streets, though narrow, are broad enough for every useful purpose, in a country where wheel carriages are entirely unknown. From the best inquiries I could make, I have reason to believe that Sago contains altogether about 30,000 inhabitants. The king of Bambara constantly resides at Sago Sea Coro. He employs a great many slaves in conveying people over the river, and the money they receive, though the fare is only ten cowrie shells for each individual, furnishes a considerable revenue to the king in the course of a year. The canoes are of singular construction, each of them being formed of the trunks of two large trees, rendered concave and joined together, not side by side but end ways, the junction being exactly across the middle of the canoe. They are therefore very long and disproportionately narrow, and have neither decks nor masts. They are, however, very roomy, for I observed in one of them four horses and several people crossing over the river. When we arrived at the ferry, with a view to pass over to that part of the town in which the king resides, we found a great number waiting for a passage. They looked at me with silent wonder, and I distinguished with concern many moors among them. There were three different places of embarkation, and the ferrymen were very diligent and expeditious but from the crowd of people I could not immediately obtain a passage, and sat down upon the bank of the river to wait for a more favorable opportunity. The view of this extensive city, the numerous canoes upon the river, the crowded population, and the cultivated state of the surrounding country formed altogether a prospect of civilization and magnificence which I little expected to find in the bosom of Africa. I waited more than two hours without having an opportunity of crossing the river, during which time the people who had crossed carried information to Masong, the king, that a white man was waiting for a passage and was coming to see him. He immediately sent over one of his chief men, who informed me that the king could not possibly see me until he knew what had brought me into his country, and that I must not presume to cross the river without the king's permission. He therefore advised me to lodge at a distant village, to which he pointed for the night, and said that in the morning he would give me further instructions how to conduct myself. This was very discouraging. However, as there was no remedy, I set off for the village, where I found, to my great mortification, that no person would admit me into his house. I was regarded with astonishment and fear, and was obliged to sit all day without victuals in the shade of a tree, and the night threatened to be very uncomfortable for the wind rose, and there was great appearance of a heavy rain, and the wild beasts are so very numerous in the neighborhood that I should have been under the necessity of climbing up a tree and resting among the branches. About sunset, however, as I was preparing to pass the night in this manner, and had turned my horse loose that he might gaze at liberty, a woman, returning from the labors of the field, stopped to observe me, and perceiving that I was weary and, and dejected, inquired into my situation, which I briefly explained to her, whereupon, with looks of great compassion, she took 
up my saddle and bridle and told me to follow her having conducted me into her hut she lighted up a lamp spread a mat on the floor and told me i might remain there for the night finding that i was very hungry she said she would procure me something to eat she accordingly went out and returned in a short time with a very fine fish which having caused to be half broiled upon some elm embers she gave me for supper the rites of hospitality being thus performed towards a stranger in distress my worthy benefactress pointing to the mat and telling me i might sleep there without apprehension called to the female part of her family who had stood gazing on me all the while in a fixed astonishment to resume their task of spinning cotton in which they continued to employ themselves great part of the night they lightened their labor by songs one of which was composed ex tempore for i was myself the subject of it it was sung by one of the young women the rest joining in a sort of chorus the air was sweet and plaintive and the words literally translated were these the winds roared and the rains felled the poor white man faint and weary came and sat under our tree he has no mother to bring him milk no wife to grind his corn chorus let us pity the white man no mother has he etc etc trifling as this recital may appear to the reader to a person in my situation the circumstance was affecting in the highest degree i was oppressed by such unexpected kindness and slept fled from my eyes in the morning i presented my compassionate landlady with two of the four brass buttons which remained on my waistcoat the only recompense i could make her july twenty first i continued in the village all this day in conversation with the natives who came in crowds to see me but was rather uneasy towards evening to find that no message had arrived from the king the more so the people began to whisper that mansong had received some very unfavorable accounts of me from the moors and slatees residing at sago who, who it seems were exceedingly suspicious concerning the motives of my journey i learned that many consultations had been held with the king concerning my reception and disposal and some of the villagers frankly told me that i had many enemies and must expect no favor july twenty second about eleven o'clock a messenger arrived from the king but he gave me very little satisfaction he inquired particularly if i had brought any present and seemed much disappointed when he was told that i had been robbed of everything by the moors when i proposed to go along with him he told me to stop until the afternoon when the king would send for me july twenty third in the afternoon another messenger arrived from Masson with a bag in his hands he told me it was the king's pleasure that i should depart forthwith from the vinissage of sago but that a song wishing to relieve a white man in distress had sent me five thousand cowries to enable me to purchase provisions in the course of my journey the messenger added that if my intentions were really to proceed to jenny he had orders to accompany me as a guide to san sanding i was at first puzzled to account for this behavior of the king but from the conversation i had with the guide i had afterwards reason to believe that masson would willingly have admitted me into his presence at sago but was apprehensive he might not be able to protect me against the blind and inveterate 
malice of the moorish inhabitants his conduct therefore was at once prudent and liberal the circumstances under which i made my appearance at sago were undoubtedly such as might create in the mind of the king a well wanted suspicion that i wished to conceal the true object of my journey he argued probably as my guide argued who when he was told that i had come from a great distance and though many dangers to behold the joliba river naturally inquired if there were no rivers in my own country and whether one river was not like another notwithstanding this and in spite of the jealous machinations of the moors this benevolent prince thought it sufficient that a white man was found in his dominions in a condition of extreme wretchedness and that no other plea was necessary to entitle the sufferer to his bounty